to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. For usual, it's a late Monday night on the 18th as I record this. And uh, if you've clicked on this episode, you've probably seen this is probably one of the longer episodes in D1R history here. It's full of really, really good stuff. D1R85 is certainly going to go down as one of the better ones. We've got two fantastic guests, uh, not players, not coaches, but two of my great connections in the media. First off is Wayne Cavati uh, covering D2 football for NCAA.com. He joins me here to break down the super regions for the D2 football playoffs. And then joined later on by Frank Rossi, the co-host of the In the Huddle podcast covering all things D3 football. He is one of the most knowledgeable humans uh, when it comes to D3 football on the planet. Both these guys are incredibly insightful when it comes to their respective levels of football. So very privileged and honored to have them on the show tonight. I, of course, will add my commentary when it comes to D2 football. The playoff brackets are here. We've got postseason football, playoffs, and outside of playoffs and bowl games to talk about as well at all levels. Uh, Jimmy Martin, Matt Schwarzler join me for D3 and NAI football, respectively. Man, there is so much going on. I'm just very excited to get right into it, so I won't waste too much time with the introduction. As always, you can watch the episode on YouTube if you are. Don't forget the video chat. Chapters, bottom of the screen right there. Fast forward to any part of the conversation you'd like to get to. Otherwise, follow us on the socials. Just hit 11K on Instagram. And if you guys do remember, I said, hey, at 10K followers, I'm going to drop a new t-shirt. Well, you guys hit 11K before I could get it done. It's here. You can see the uh, little patch right here, little alternate logo on the D1R. Small school product on the back of the T. These will be dropping semi soon. So uh, definitely be on the lookout for those. Just a clean, simple t-shirt, something that everyone can get behind. Small school product is such a cool way of kind of embracing the level of football and really the level of any sport that you play at. It doesn't say small school football product. Uh, this is for people that play, uh, you know, whether that's D3, D2, NAIA, shoot. Some FCS people even consider themselves kind of small school products. So whoever it fits the bill for, we wanted to make sure that kind of represented that. And hopefully uh, we can get you guys to get your hands on some of these t-shirts. So without much more ado, let's get into the first guest co our conversation of the night, excuse me, with the man himself, the Dean of D2, Wayne Cavati. Join the show tonight to shine some light on the enigma that is D2 football playoffs. It is the return of Wayne Cavati. What's up, man? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the uh, busy time of the year. There's a little tournament about to start. So uh, just looking forward to some of the best football we've been waiting for all year. Amen. You say it lightly, but certainly so. We have the, the playoff bracket fully revealed now for Division Two, And let's just go through super region by region. Talk about it. The first one, I don't think... It was anything too crazy. Kutztown taking the number one overall, especially after that PSAC championship game performance. Them in Charleston, I guess was maybe a little bit of a mix-up for a time there as far as who would lock up that one seed in the bye. Uh, any kind of thoughts on that? Those two seemed like locks, but from there on out, I think this the Super Region could have gone maybe a variety of different ways as far as where the teams were seeded. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. Um, you know, for me, I was doing my projections on the D2 report starting in mid-October-ish. Yeah. Um, so I did have Kutztown all the way there because I, you know, I figured if they, if it was at that point, if it was Cal or Slippery Rock, whoever it was, they played in the PSAC championship. And if they won, that would give them the metrics needed to to jump Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, it's more 1A, 1B. You know, if you look at the metrics, they're so super close. It's just the, the, what, what separated them was the minutiae. Um, and Kutztown got that advantage. And that's the way it looked like it was going to happen from, from the outset. Uh, Cal had to go over Slippery Rock because they, they beat them. So that was pretty yep. obvious there. Um, really, the, the exciting part, East Stroudsburg and New Haven were pretty much in for the last couple of weeks, if, in my opinion. The exciting part was what happened with Ashland and Finley. Yes. Um, Finley had that spot locked up and then were, was upset. By Tiffin, um, I don't know if you call it an upset, but based on regional rankings, technically it was speaking, a, right, the battle of two twenty four. Exactly, the lower seed came out on top, so it was an upset in that aspect, and that opened the door and, and got Ashland in because of who you know the the earlier wins Ashland had against the the like competition. Yeah. Um, so you know, Super Region One is usually not in the sense that. It's not a deep region, but it's so familiar that it's usually the easiest to project right from the start. And, um, of course, a couple teams shift in and out, but, you know, right from the start, this is kind of what it looked like. But to your point, it was how the seeding was going to go, and and that all played itself out for, luckily, very easily the last week yeah. of the season. There weren't wasn't much to do. 
Yeah, Ashland was really you kind of mentioned that what the quote unquote surprise and uh, the depth of the PSAC. I think we expected at the start of the year. Now, did we know what four teams would be in there? The top two, I think for sure. The Slippery Rock and, and Kutztown came into the year with a lot of momentum, and uh, there were obviously some questions from people. The Cal PA they, they retained their their third spot even after that loss in the PSAC championship. But you talked about the head to head and that metric and mm-hmm. that that should mean something, right? And when you come to this this part of the year, it certainly should, and it seems like. At certain points of this bracket, it does, and then maybe at others, not so much leaned on as heavily. Um, but that's a different conversation. But, uh, <laughs> right. you know, right. New Haven in there as well, it seemed like they were pretty locked up, especially with this earned access rule and uh, representation yep. over there from the NE10. So that was that was one that was certainly going to happen, and you talked about that that Finley upset from Tiff. And I think that's the, the biggest takeaways from here, but the, the depth of the PSAC. I mean, again, not mm-hmm. necessarily incredibly surprising, although is it maybe a little bit frustrating that we get – uh, a regular season rematch of Slippery Rock and New yeah. Haven in that round one, and then obviously a PSAC uh, foes there in Cal PA and East Stroudsburg? Yeah, I mean, that, and that's always going to be part of the aspect with regionalization is that yep. you're going to run into that, um, and you have to make it that the seeding plays out so that the rightful home team is a ho- you know is a host that seed that's higher, and that's just unfortunate one of the 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 i don't want to say it's a downside but it is one of the factors of of regionalization is that you're going to run into those rematches um one little tidbit about new haven and i'm not sure the exact number i think it was five and i found this interesting is they're one of just like four or five teams to have made it four years in a row really uh, in the entire tournament and you know they're in the company like ferris states and yeah. Hardings. you know it's like a it, so it's pretty impressive that they, they they keep finding their way back in there and um, they should definitely get kudos for that. No, that's that is certainly deserving of props, and that's an offense that I believe is averaging almost like 35 points per game right now against, yeah. you know, and again inside a conference play, maybe not the toughest schedule or gauntlet, so to speak. But there are some teams over there, and you know, squads like Assumption and Saint Anselm had a decent year, and a Bentley team yeah. that comes out. You know, there's it's not like every week over there is a cupcake. I certainly don't want to give that impression. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. Over to Super Region number two, I think uh, the biggest case, Valdosta State coming at the one seed, the bye, seemingly made a lot of sense from my perspective. I think there was some conversation for Wingate maybe having a case for the number one seed coming off of that SAC championship game where they kind of uh, slayed their demons, so to speak. Uh, yeah. That Carson Newman, that that loss that haunted them from earlier in the season, their only loss of the year. But talk to me about this Super Region, what you see. First of all, not necessarily about the Super Region, but we have to give kudos to Wingate. Wingate. Their defense is absurd. Yes. Uh, and, and they can, I think Valdosta State is the number one, but the Bulldogs are just as much a team to beat here. They, mm-hmm. they, they are, that defense is amazing, especially what they did to Carson Newman, as you said, in that championship game. But I do agree. I thought coming into those last three weeks, Valdosta State's early season was a little bit softer than others just based on numbers. That West Alabama game was erased because of the hurricane, so we didn't yes. get to see what they would do against a, a team. And But then they came in and they played Delta State and West Florida, and those were two teams in the playoff conversation, and they handled them, like dominated Emphasis them. Emphasis on handled, absolutely. Yes, and uh, we're looking at a team that has a top 10 offense and top 10 defense in pretty much every st- stat. So, you know, that's not part of the selection process, but is it – show that they're deserving absolutely um and it was tight it was definitely tight because wingate has that strength of schedule but you know at the end of the day valdosta state won their conference went undefeated and uh, i think those those last two wins were the metric where pushed the metrics to where they needed to be that number one i agree with you there and i think valdosta their their offense and has been the focal point of the conversation around that team especially you know the quarterback position and uh that's something that i think overshadows a lot of other pieces of their team that maybe uh people don't realize are very good right they are a very complimentary playing football team that we talk about um i know i do about wingate that has you know feels like plays all three phases very well but is right Mm -hmm. there we just uh maybe that gets overshadowed by some of the stuff they have going on offensively because they've been that good um and you know moving down the list virginia union they get in after that ciaa championship they'll uh go over to wingate to take on the bulldogs and um then from there west alabama lenore ryan lenore ryan one of those teams that was uh certainly maybe not one of the ones that was predicted by most people i should say to to come in and and nab one of those final spots there talk about uh those two matchups i mean this is where i'm not envious to be in the selection committee because not Lenore ryan right Lenore ryan and emory and henry were so close in the metrics and you have to figure out which metric is the one that bumps one in over the other and, and that's where we talk you know, head to head and it's like how do you oh right 
Yeah, and it gets harder and harder as you go down that list. Same with Virginia Union, Winston-Salem State, and, and Johnson C. Smith. But the yeah. committee ultimately came to their decision. And if you're, you know, I think all the teams were worthy. And, and that's that's the problem with another factor of regionalization. And I think um, I'm really interested in seeing what Jada Byers can do against that Wingate defense. I mean, it, it's going to be one of the best matchups of the first round is him versus them. You know, um, and then West Alabama, you know, I didn't really get to watch too much of them. And I went to their game uh, two weeks ago against Shorter and they're okay. really, really smart. Right. They may not be atop the statistical leaderboards with the best quarterback and running back by stats, but they're really smart in how they play the game on both sides of the ball. And I was really impressed with them. And, you know, Lenore Ryan's one of those teams that always they change coaches twice now in the last few what five years mm -hmm. they they change quarterbacks they change running backs and they find themselves they're always in the conversation so it's impressive and and you know it it's not a surprise to me that they found their way back in it's definitely one of those teams too i think um certainly not a metric but uh name recognition and and brand yeah. association so to speak For sure. um it could For certainly sure. play a subliminal part in in that selection not to say they're not deserving because like you said there are a lot of teams that are and uh not to brush over miles either i believe right now yeah. looks like the top scoring defense out of the siac right now and this is a team in a, a defense that i'm very curious to see what that matchup looks like against Carson Newman. And um, I, admittedly, I don't believe they've seen that style of offense from a team like this. So how do they uh -huh. respond from that on kind of a quote-unquote short week uh, as far as prep is concerned and finding out their slate? That will be a kind of an intriguing matchup for me. But we can keep moving over to the gauntlet that is Super Region number three. And I think um, out of all the Super Regions, this for me was the most cut and dry as far as not any surprises here for me. I kind of understood where these teams were going to be at. And the simple fact is that all these teams won and took care of business. Um, and there wasn't a lot of shakeups here. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, but to your point, coming down the stretch, Fort Hayes State, uh, Central Missouri, Southern Arkansas, none of those teams made it easy, right? No, like, they did not. It's, it's like you said, every one of these teams had to win or they were done. Whoever lost was out. Yeah. Um, and, it, it, and you know, it's Super Region 3 should have its own tournament after this <laughs> and, and just extend that to 28 teams, and I would watch. Um, yes. But, yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at national champions all over the place in here, and, um, you know, like, Again, I wouldn't want to be in that room. I admittedly, I got the the region right in my projections. I admittedly, I had Ferris State, Grand Valley State, Pittsburgh State, and then I thought the the Washita win over Henderson State it, to to take the GAC was going to bump them over Central Oklahoma right. and get yep. that that host seed. I admit I was wrong there, but those metrics are so close um, that I understand. Like I don't I don't disagree with it. I just uh, I just had it projected a little differently. And then you know you. You have Harding in there down at the sixth seed, and they're the defending national champs that set just about every record in the rushing yeah. book that you could set last year. And it's, it's and now you got to go on the road, right? You're ten and one. You got to go on the road uh, to defend your national championship. It's just amazing what happens in that part of the of the country. It is, and there's a lot of teams that are very happy that Zowska, Zach Zabrowski, excuse me, will be on not none that. of these. <laughs> brackets um yeah. and not just him obviously that team down there UCM has been playing also very complimentary football in like all three phases and they've had their slips and stumbles along the way I believe three losses uh, along the year but you look at some of those wins over the opponents down there in the MIAA who has just cannibalized itself and Pittsburgh mm -hmm. State UCO come out of it Central Oklahoma winning their first outright MIAA championship is obviously uh, big time news for the Broncos down there and then Saginaw might have been one of those teams too that would have potentially made yeah. things interesting but how about a Michigan Tech fourth quarter comeback to force the Cardinals even out of the conversation and even with a win there and, and say you jump over you Indy who again took care of business that earned access rule comes into play and that's not something that would have yeah. really shaken up the standings uh, whatsoever but I think the one team I'm, I'm curious to hear about from you is this Grand Valley squad and they've been I would say suspect I think is the term at a couple points throughout this season you look at that uh, lacrosse game where admittedly they were down a couple quarterbacks at mm -hmm. home that was a one score contest this past week maybe not putting away a Roosevelt team early on like a lot of people would have expected or uh, a couple different games where they didn't seem to just jump up and, and take a commanding lead against opponents where maybe people thought it should be more of a blowout and not a two score contest now with that being said they've handled business for the most part outside of a you know the anomaly that is the Ferris State Bulldogs but uh 
What can we expect from the Lakers? They still have a lot of playmakers on both sides of the ball. So I think you nailed it on the head, but I think this is what we've typically seen from Grand Valley State, right? They have playmakers on all sides of the ball, but they're so deep that none of those guys are superstars, right? They're not going to have a lot of All-Americans just because they're not getting the stats, but they are All-American worthy players on both sides of the ball and special teams. And I think that's just the way Grand Valley State does. They, 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 they win games. They don't care how they win games, right? Fair. And sometimes it's gonna, you're gonna scratch your head and 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 be like, wow, that game should have been a lot more lopsided. But then they're gonna have wins against CSU Pueblo and and all the other schools that they need to beat, you know? Yep. Um, Dominant sure performance Paris, against a West Florida squad that I watched from start yeah. to finish, and that was an eye-opening yeah. experience. Right. Right. So, you know, and and those are the teams that are going to be playing here. And, you know, the Ferris State game, you got to remember, they lost both their, their, their starting and yep. their, their second string quarterback. And look, you don't make any excuses against Ferris State. You Like, it, it's not going to be an easy thing, even with those guys. So I don't want to say that would have changed anything. But to to look at that as their only loss, the number one team in the country, in my opinion, you know, in, in D2. Um, I think that's that's a, a a big part of it, and I think Grand Valley State is definitely going to hold its own. Um, I, I think uh, you know UND having to go into Lubber Stadium in November is I'm not envious of them. No. Uh, you know, not many I, are. I think, I think they should be fine in the first round, which gives us a potential Ferris State Grand Valley State. You know, another another go round, and we'll see how that is. But you got to, you know, to your point last year, remember that Harding Grand Valley State game was seven to six, and and Harding won in like the last minutes of the game. So yeah, it was like an eight minute drive down the field of just the death <laughs> march, basically for the for the Bisons. Yeah, and that's what so that. Just you know, back to my point is Grand Valley State doesn't care how they win. If it's a slugfest, they find a way. If it's not their best, they still find a way, and and that's just the way that they they've always done things, in my opinion. And I and that's fine for me because you at the end of the day you figure out how to win. I'm with you there. They're going to wear teams out. I think they certainly yeah. are. they have already. I mean, you have a dominant ground attack they have, and Eichelberger out of the backfield fits that style I think very well. Talk about his physical frame, but he's also fast, like. Too fast for for that size, and the people are not supposed to move like that when they're built like that. And so there's uh, there's a lot going for their for their ground game. But to close things off, Super Region Four, the fourth time Mankato and Augustana have played in the last two years. We get a first round rematch from last year, courtesy of of Wit over there. D Duval, I didn't know that one, but he he brought that up. Um, yeah, outside yeah. of that, Pueblo takes the the one spot. We have a different RMAC team heading up the Super Region this year, and then uh, Bemidji and Angelo is going to certainly be an interesting one. The Beavers went down and. Took out a really prominent offense in UTPB last year. Their defense traveled very well. And now you have still the number one scoring defense in the NSIC, taking on Angelo State, who's back after kind of a rebound year. And uh, finally, Mountaineers, Wildcats, Western Colorado, and Washington. Kind of uh, seemingly a very wide-open super region, but everything goes through Pueblo and the Thunderdome. And uh, first of all, Thunderdome. How, how awesome is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Thunderbowl, excuse me, not Dome. Thunderbowl. Yeah, yeah you're sorry. Right, Thunderbowl. Yes. Uh, my fault. Uh, but, you know, it, it. I think you hit it. It's This is the most wide open region. I think anything can happen here. Um, you know, Bemidji, they came alive at the end. Uh, won their, they, they literally earned their way into this. I yes. know everyone earns their way, but they fought their way to get that last spot. Um, and uh, everyone, they've been, this is their fourth year in a row, and not enough people talk about the fact that they've won their first round game every year. Yes. Like, this is a battle-tested team that always comes through and i think this angelo state team i actually had angelo state as the number two over western colorado okay but so i had those flipped in my projections but this angelo state team's really good but bemidji has that first round magic that i think this is going to be a lot better game than a lot of people are anticipating um and then yeah augustana and, and minnesota state there's no love lost there uh you know regular season they meet re- playoffs they meet um and i think the the western colorado offense against that central Washington defense is a perfect matchup for the first round and should be very exciting. But like you said, like these, these Thunderwolves, uh, I, I think I pointed it out in my power 10 rankings. The last time the Thunderwolves won the, uh, RMAC was 2014 and they happened to win the national championship the same year. Yep. So if, uh, history repeats itself, um, like you said, it does, it goes through the Thunderdome and you got to consider them the favorites because of that advantage. And, um, but it is wide open, and I think anything can happen here. Yeah, it's wide open in terms of who could come out on top, also wide open, and this is probably the largest geographic spread 
that we have yeah. out of all of them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, if only Western Oregon somehow had snuck their way into this too, and we could have just had a ridiculously large <laughs> overreach yeah. of just covering half the country. I was going to say every state uh, west of the Mississippi would have had representation. <laughs> yeah, it's just let's just lump them into the Lone Star, I suppose. <laughs> but awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate it. I won't hold too much more of your time. Thank you so much for uh, for joining me tonight. I'm excited to get going this weekend. Hopefully, going to be um, on site for you know maybe a game or two here as we as we get going. But uh, any any early picks for who we can expect to see in uh, Texas in December? Man, I'm I'm actually working on my my prediction piece for tomorrow morning, so I'm not there yet. But I it looks like you're at the stadium a... already. Are you camping out until the championship game? <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna be here until <laughs> December. Uh, um, but I look, man, I I love what Valdosta State's doing. I, yeah, I, you know, I think they have to be real strong contenders, and you know, obviously, it's going to be someone from Super Region Three in the mix. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, and the question is, is Who's it going to be? Yeah, and, uh, I don't know that I can answer that at this moment, but I'm going to have to guess. And I, I guess you you lean towards Ferris State, but I would not be surprised at all to see Harding figure out a way to come out of that bracket with mm -hmm. all the experience they have from last year's run. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, but I think there's there's about four or five true contenders in, in my eye that are really have a chance to, to win it all. But I think all 28 teams are, are right there in the conversation. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Wayne, thank you very much for your time, my friend. I appreciate it. You have a good rest of your night. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. Of course. I'll see you. All right, big thank you to Wayne for joining the show. Now it's on to me. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on D2 recaps today because uh, most of the conversation should be revolved around that playoff field, but uh, there were a lot of really good football games that were we'll playing this last week, and I think I'd be, you know, excuse me, man, in the wrong if I didn't talk about them. So let's start things off with what was essentially a play-in game for this Bemidji State squad. And shout out Dakota News Now for this these highlights right here. But Beavers taking on Augustana. And uh, this ended up being a really important game. Bemidji State takes this one 17-10 behind some really solid late off offensive performances, if you will. And Sam McGath didn't have the craziest stat line of the day, but converted when it counted. I think that was kind of the the saying of this Beaver offense. You see him there getting into the end zone. And Bemidji, who has the top scoring defense right now in the NSIC, they take this one. That front seven, front four, if you will, for this Bemidji squad has been making a lot of noise. They continue to do so against a really quality Augustana opponent. And that really was, like I said, their playing game. Augustana obviously had clinched so to speak, not technically speaking, but everyone kind of knew they'd be in the dance. But for this Beaver squad, that was a win and get in type situation. They stepped up to the task and they find themselves in the playing field in Super Region 4 heading down to Angelo State to take on the Rams. Moving forward, though, a game that I had the privilege to watch on Saturday quite a bit. That was the PSAC Championship game. Kutztown, who's the number one seed in Super Region. I believe that's number one. Uh, yeah, I think I'm correct there. They take on Cal PA in the PSAC championship here. Vulcans and Bears in this one. And you know what? Kutztown got things going early here. You see the touchdown pass. And I see this score, and here I am thinking this could be a pretty one-sided contest. And admittedly, I hadn't watched too many of the Vulcans games this year. And you know what? I had to put some respect on their name. The offense came out, and they made some plays when it mattered. They didn't do a whole lot in the first half, though, which I think you'll notice kind of watching this tape. One of those drives getting snuffed out here. The fumble and the turnover on downs, seemingly. And uh, that kind of stuffed out a couple of their drives in the first half, those turnovers, and they couldn't get anything going. Now, though, into the third quarter, they score here on the quarterback keep, and we had a tied ball game in the third quarter. The Vulcans all of a sudden making this thing very interesting. Now, Kutztown would not take too much longer to respond here. That is a big-time run from Jane Stewart, 41 yards to be exact to give the Bears the advantage, and uh, they would double up on that. That's Burkhart getting in on the two-yard touchdown run. Kutztown would take a 21-7 lead, and from there, I mean, this one was pretty much wrapped up. Black uh, Davis Black, excuse me, uh, had a three-yard run. You'll see right here, I believe this is it. To uh, make it a little bit more interesting, hell of a play by him, by the way, just jumping over another human to, to reach across the pylon, but uh, too little, too late for that Cal PA squad. Kutztown takes things and closes out their very impressive year inside of PSAC conference play and both those teams still very much in the playoffs but uh definitely worth mentioning that game had a lot riding on it now we go over to the nsic where this one didn't exactly pan out how we expected it to minnesota state mankato taking on minnesota 
uh, Duluth, excuse me, and Mankato in the dance this year. Duluth not, but that doesn't necessarily indicate how this game turned out. Duluth takes this one 30-16, and they got started kind of early here. You see Mankato really struggling offensively. Bulldogs in the backfield happened quite a bit in this one. Kyle Walljass from under center here for the Bulldogs, making things happen on the pitch sweep on the outside or buck sweep, I guess, whatever you want to call that one. Break it on the sideline. Duluth put together a couple quality drives in the second quarter. They went into halftime up 13 to 9 and then outscored the Mavericks 17 to 7 in the second half to pick up this one. Wall Jasper. They kind of contained him. Mankato did a relatively good job. 18 carries, only had 77 yards, which for him, if you've watched any Duluth football, you know that he can he can uh, run up the stat sheet pretty quickly there on the rushing attack. He was very efficient, though, through the air. 16 to 26, 177 yards and three touchdowns. No turnovers through the air for Wall Jasper. You're going to see him here connect on a long touchdown pass. Wide open wide receiver right there. So uh, Duluth, a really strong showing. I think a big cliff, po- uh, cliff note here. They shut down the rushing attack of Mankato. 29 yet, uh, net yards, excuse me, for that Minnesota State offense. And... Not enough to get Duluth in the dance, per se, but a, nonetheless, a very statement win for this Bulldog squad over a really talented uh, Maverick team over there in uh, at Minnesota State. So, we'll keep things moving forward. Let's go over to the GLIAC. The first ever Calder City Classic, Ferris State hosting Davenport. Thank you to ABC 13 for these highlights here as we take a look at this showdown between the Bulldogs and the Panthers. And this one, I thought, admittedly, was going to be pretty one-sided. I thought Ferris would kind of bully ball their way into a very dominant win. And the final score was 24-9, to so you might think it was kind of indicative of that. I watched a decent chunk of this and kind of followed along with it. That was very much not the case. Davenport came to play in this one at Ferris State in Big Rapids. I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not a fan at all of these yellow jerseys, these gold jerseys from Ferris. It's like a... Uh, Ronald McDonald type of beat here, but uh, Brady Rose getting loose and getting into the end zone, that is uh, certainly a different type of feel for this Ferris State offense. And Davenport actually led at halftime, 9-7. to seven. Davenport had things going on. You see some deep balls completed here. The Davenport Panther passing attack had some things going on. And uh, Ferris State kind of came out in the second half and, and kind of imposed their will physically, which is what we've known them to do. When you look at some of the the stats and the breakdown here. The total offense wasn't exactly a ridiculous number. Uh, I think there wasn't a lot of really one-sided statistics on either side. Um, But when you do look at it, the penalty numbers here, Ferris State, uh, not that it's very uncharacteristic of them, 12 penalties for 110 yards is something that they cannot afford to do into the playoffs, especially in Super Region number 3. That was a big-time hit. Holy. Uh, But 110 yards on on, uh, penalties is not something that this Bulldog team can afford to do if they want to make a deeper playoff run. And, uh, you know, four sacks in the day as well. Interceptions from both sides. Some sloppy football being played. I think it also is a credit, though, to two quality defenses that were going back and forth. Let's go over to the GMAC now. In a game that ended up actually having some playoff implications, not in the way that you might expect. The battle of 224 between Finley and Tiffin, this time being hosted by the Dragons, they end up taking this one in a very dominant fashion. 37 to 14, Tiffin takes down the Oilers from Finley. And I mentioned earlier that this had some playoff implications. Tiffin is not in the playoffs. So this is not in the way that you might have thought. Finley, though, they were in the Super Region rankings. They were a top 25 opponent coming into this game. And Tiffin really, it seemingly played spoiler here for a Finley team that wanted to get back into the playoffs. And because of this result, you now see Ashland come out one as the GMAC champion and now also sneak into the playoffs in uh, in that Super Region. I believe that's number two. And come in and get a shot at the dance. So uh, while Tiffin, does, this didn't necessarily benefit themselves here outside of a nice rivalry win for this Dragon squad, they earned Ashland a playoff spot, which is definitely worth noting. This game was pretty one-sided, to be honest with you. It was 21-0 Tiffin early in the second quarter, and they'd go into halftime 21-14. Finley started to make a bounce back, uh, turnover here or there, had the Oilers back in it. But again, Tiffin separates themselves. They score three con- consecutive series in the, the second half, a field goal and two touchdowns and then another field goal and This one kind of got out of control late. So um, a little bit of fight from Finley. Not enough to finish things off. Tiffin gets uh, a well-earned win. Let's keep it going. 
I told you I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I don't want to, you know, elaborate on them too much, but there's a lot of great football being played. And again, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it. This one was certainly up there with the rest of the best games this week. The Battle of the Ravine, Wachita Baptist, Henderson State in a big time rivalry game. Wachita takes this one 27 20, or a great rebound after the Reddies took the rivalry game last year. The Tigers take this one uh, on the road, which again, we know that it's not much of a travel. It's right across the street to get over there. But this game certainly was back and forth. Wachita was leading 10 to 6 at the half. A lot more scoring happened in the second half here, but uh, Wachita actually retained a lead all the way until the fourth quarter where Henderson tied it up on a Caden Davis 35-yard touchdown pass from uh, Andrew Edwards, and it went all the way down to the final two minutes. Wachita scores on a Kendall Givens one-yard touchdown run to give them the edge, and the Tigers keep their playoff hopes alive because you think about it, this Wachita team, if you lose there, there was a really good chance you'd be knocked out of Super Region 3 given how competitive the field is in that region. So I think I can't even overstate how important of a win that was for that Wachita team. It also clinches them a share of the GAC championship, of which I'm pretty sure they split with Harding this year. So, whew, moving forward, which is kind of interesting because they had the head-to-head, so I'm not sure how exactly how that works. Moving forward, we got another conference championship game, this time down in the SAC, the SAC championship. It was Carson Newman at Wingate. And if you remember earlier in the season, Wingate's only loss is to this Carson Newman squad. So coming into this one, Wingate, the Bulldogs, able to slay their demons when it counts, some would say. 28-13, Bulldogs take this one over the Eagles. And again, a really big-time win. Some were arguing that Wingate kind of had a conversation to be the number one seed in that super region. I could certainly still give it to Valdosta State, but Wingate has certainly made a kind of an exclamation point and I'm staking their claim there. Uh, Wingate looked really solid in this one, playing a lot of complimentary football. You talk about the defensive effort from Wingate. Uh, two forced fumbles in the day. We had uh, Joseph Reddish with two interceptions for that Bulldog squad. Kai Russell led the way with 10 tackles and a sack. Uh, Daniel Morrison was in the backfield as well, quite a bit for this Wingate squad. And uh, offensively, not a whole lot going on for Wingate. I think the defense and special teams really stepped up here for that Bulldog squad. They got it done, played some really complimentary football, and those are your sack champions. You also have, here we go, maybe, uh, Virginia Union and Virginia State, the rematch for the CIAA title. Shout out to WTVR CBS 6. That's a mouthful for these highlights. And we talked about it. They got a they played a game last week, and now they get a rematch for uh, all the marbles, so to speak, in the CIAA championship. Virginia Union able to bounce back and take down the Trojans on a neutral site, and I believe, or not neutral site. It was in, I think it was actually in Salem. I want to say there you go, Salem Stadium. Uh, I am correct. I second guess myself sometimes. You see, kind of a fake kick here that gets sniffed out by the Panthers. They come up and take that one out, and Virginia Union would go on to win this one. They've also clinched their way into the D2 football playoffs. This was a big-time win for this Virginia Union squad, and you look at it this way as well. They're the only team out of the CIAA that made it into the playoffs. Johnson C. Smith, Winston-Salem State, those two teams are probably first in the list of teams that got, depending on who you ask, wrongfully snubbed, right? So for them to get that playoff nod is very important for this VUU squad. They made some things happen there. She touched down late there from the Panthers. Okay. That's kind of all the video highlights for today. I got some other quick hitters, though, that are certainly worth mentioning as we keep going. Franklin Pierce goes into assumption, pulls out the 29-21-19 win, excuse me, in double overtime to finish the year at even 500. That's big for that Franklin Pierce squad. Lock Haven, they picked up a 21-13 road win at Gannon behind career highs on offense and four interceptions from the Bald Eagle defense. Fairmont State used the last-second field goal to lift them over Frostburg State in MEC action. Emmanuel Richardson, 28 yards out, knocks that one through the uprights for the win. How about Fort Hayes State in the MIAA? They outlasted Nebraska Kearney, 27-20. Upper Iowa, this is kind of a cool story from the Peacocks, who were in the NSIC for a long time, moved over to the GLVC. They have eclipsed seven wins for the first time in their D2 era since moving to Division II. Now, I can already hear, and I, I I think it too, like, of course it coincides with leaving the NSIC. You start to win some games. I don't want that to be the knock on this team. That is still a great accomplishment. Seven wins for any football team is something that you should be incredibly proud of. But uh, 
if you were to have seven wins in the NSIC, we'd be talking about this team a little bit differently. But the trajectory for this this Peacock team right now is on the up. And so I think that's the most important note right now uh, for Upper Iowa. Miles defeats Clark Atlanta 53-25 for that SIAC championship. Miles will host a playoff game. You got Pittsburgh State using a strong first half to beat Northwest Missouri State in their regular season finale 23-7. Pitt State will also host. They'll host Harding. And then, of course, Michigan Tech scoring 22 points unanswered in the fourth quarter to win at Saginaw Valley, 32-28. And uh, Saginaw Valley was not going to get into the playoffs regardless, but still a very, very, just like exactly the kind of win you expect from Michigan Tech. Gritty fourth quarter comeback, two recovered onside kicks. Alex Freeze goes and has himself a game. Gleak player of the week offensively. Uh, a big-time win for those Huskies. Central Washington, they hold on at home over Western Oregon, 13-3, a low-scoring affair. And finally... Valdosta State beats West Florida for the GSC crown 28 to 7. They handle them. Valdosta State has showed up when it mattered. West Florida, Delta State. We did not get to see that West Alabama matchup, but Valdosta State has been playing some very, very good football right now in all three phases. But that's all for D2. Let's move over and talk to Frank Rossi and get the scoop on the D3 playoff field. Joining the show tonight, this man. Truly needs no introduction. I'll give him one anyways. You should know him as uh, the co-host of the In the Huddle podcast covering all things D3 football, of which he's been on site almost every weekend covering games this season. Commendable. Seriously. Uh, it's the man himself, Frank Rossi. What's going on? Listen, you had JB on, uh, you know, long ago and far away. I, I had to join the fun. He told me how much fun this was, and I could use some fun around this time of year because we don't have enough fun doing shows about playoffs and bowls and everything else. So, you know, it's time for some D1 rejects. I, I'm thrilled. Let's get it on here. I appreciate that, man. And I guess that's a good uh, segue for me, giving you guys the kudos of the work that you guys put into and in trying to, uh, one, figure out the actual math that goes behind the playoff selections, but also um, how transparent you guys are and, and all the information that you provide to the landscape is something that I do not do. Um, and that's just kind of partially out of necessity of me trying to learn and also out of choice in that um, I just – it's not something I've ever really focused on, but I think it's it's a necessity for people who really enjoy and are passionate about the landscape like you guys are. So I want to say thank you for providing that service because that I know is something that um, I don't really get into too much on this show, and I think that's it's good that there are places that kind of have different perspectives on all this stuff. We're going to talk all about it uh, tonight, but before we get into that, I had mentioned, man, it feels like every weekend you're on site for another set – of incredible games. Talk about some of those trips you've made throughout the course of this year, starting off with this last weekend, man, the Monon Bell. That had to have been, it looked incredible, that environment. That's going to be a bucket list one for me. It, it was. And I mean, just the fact that the Cardin Auxiliary stands for this game, uh, at least the PAW did, and you could barely see the scoreboard because this mm -hmm. is not the natural, you know, atmosphere for the scoreboard, basically be almost wrapped into these stands. And just to see those stands fill up and, uh, I was on both sidelines, but, you know, I try to go where the sunlight is and, uh, you know, directly in my face because of uh, what it does to camera quality and all that stuff. But the way the sun went that day, I was on both sidelines and it was just, you know, the teams, it, it's intense. It really is intense. The fans, the student bases that are there, intense. Uh, so some not so Christian like out in the, yep, uh, the middle yep. of Indiana. Um, it, it caught some moments there. I was like, okay, uh, they probably not something to report on directly here, but uh, I, I will say they get a little carried away into the game. And uh, it is, uh, you know, I, look, I, I went to Union College. I covered the Dutchman shoes regularly. I've done Secretary's Cup. That is intense and insane too, mm -hmm. in its own way. Uh, but Mona Bell has its own, uh, let's say, je ne sais quoi or pa or whatever the hell they, yeah. they, they say. Uh, but it, it, it's something else. You, you, you need to go and experience it yourself to fully understand it. And, uh, you know, to go to Whitewater Oshkosh this year, that was insane to break the uh, on-campus record there. Mm -hmm. But this is just a whole different realm. And I can't put into words well, but when they – went over to the bell and lifted that heavy ass bell basically at that yeah. point uh, to, you know, bring it wherever they were going to finally bring it. Uh, and just trying to get to interviews on the field because the crowd streamed into the field, even though they were asked not to, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was 
Because that always works. Yeah, of course. And uh, that rivalry's got reach, man. I mean, you guys, uh, just the other night, you have the head coach from River Falls on the show, and he's talking about his time there and how that just uh, – there's nothing that matches it. Nothing at this level, in his opinion, of course. And uh, and that's just an incredible deal. But before we get into the actual playoff bracket, so to speak, I want to touch on some of the bowl games. And I think that's a really neat area of this level of football that has grown – at an alarming rate in a good way. Like really these last couple of years, this has just exploded into something that has afforded so many teams, some extra postseason play and an extra game. And you guys had a great deal. You announced the pairings for the ECAC bowl uh, games live. Talk about that experience. And again, this idea outside of postseason play for these D three squads, that, that area that continues to grow. Yeah. Uh, since before COVID uh, we have had the uh, real fortune of uh, getting to name the ECAC bowl games live and the ECAC has been doing this for a number of years, as uh, JB had said on our show on Monday. Uh, essentially, you know, all these other bowls that are out there, it, it, the ECAC was laughed at for a certain period of time for doing mm -hmm. these games. And suddenly we've seen a groundswell of new bowl games because people begin to realize, you know, teams like Cortland used to play in these bowls. And there's yep. no doubt about it. Grove City has gotten to where they are by using that extra game, that extra week of practice to their benefit to become better to who they are now, you know, household name in Division Three, essentially. And these ECAC bowl games, that's how we even got introduced to Grove City. So uh, it's a special moment to be able to tell even teams that are five and five and six and four, you get one more game. And we uh, had a live shot with uh, SUNY Morrisville for the Mustangs versus the Mustangs. That's going to be happening. Yes, of course. And that, that was uh, intense and insane there uh, uh, with Morrisville's uh, players. We had a slight delay, so we got to get the full moment from them. They're, they're silent, silent, and then they uh, <laughs> see it on the screen, and it's a pandemonium uh, in the student center uh, where they were. So uh, it was. it's just a great experience. Those are the moments we do it for. The first time we did it when Grove City showed uh, their emotion, uh, we found it on Twitter later on. We didn't even think to do live feeds like that. Yeah. Uh, we saw it on Twitter. We're like, oh, my God, we're affecting these teams in this way with kind of the surprise moment and everything. Yeah. And uh, ever since then, we've tried to introduce that element of surprise uh, into it. And it's worked really well for us. But then all these other bulls, it's great. It is truly great to see that extra postseason ability for these guys. And that kind of puts me on like two separate tangents just off like that was great from what you said there. The first part of that is that. For all these people that say, you know, what does an extra bowl game mean? You're not playing for the playoffs. There's these people out there that think that it's just another game, especially the D3 level. I, I would ask them to go watch those reactions, right, of the guys that are actually playing and participating in these games that get another week to be around this this group of guys that, uh, let's face it, will probably never be in the same room together over the course of history and uh, be with that coaching staff of guys that hopefully they really enjoy being around. And then the second tangent that it takes me on is talking about that surprise factor and something that maybe has been eliminated at this level when it comes to a lot of the postseason implications and the bracketology. And I, I think that's one of the most pure forms of the, the postseason spirit are the teams, those at-large teams, who now we've got a few more and we'll talk about it, but, man, those coveted at-large bids for those teams that didn't know maybe that if they were on the cusp or not, and now it's we're kind of at a point where it's it's pretty cut and dry, and the news is delivered in a very a very different way. How do you see that's kind of evolved over the last couple of years, and is it is it as much of a deal as maybe I make it out to be? No, it is, because I went uh, – look, we used to do the committee chair interview on our show uh, every Sunday night of, uh, you know, Selection Sunday. Yeah. But we would pre-record it the last several years uh, in the earlier afternoon, and that means that we would get a glimpse of the brackets. And last year, I knew that Union got an at-large bid, which they weren't guaranteed. So uh, living 25 minutes from Schenectady, where Union is, I drove over there, he snuck around – and basically was ready to catch their reaction at that point. And That's there's cool. nothing like that reaction. I, cool. It's just, it's crazy. Uh, this year, you know, I basically lucked into the timing of when I refreshed the page on the yep. uh, NC Stats page to see the, them post the final, you know, rankings from the NPI for Division Three football. And, you know, quickly counted to 12, figured out if indeed what the <laughs> data cast suggested was true. And they were off, I, I think, 
maybe a couple hundredths of anything. So it, maybe someday that will make a difference. I don't know, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was still there. But to say we have an official list of uh, who's in, here they are, here's your top eight. That's been viewed over 240,000 times, uh, or at least uh, the impressions are up there. And it, I, I think it reached peak status when Charlie Baker, the president of the NCAA, retweeted it today. Uh, there you go. I didn't know that. Yeah, I saw I saw Charlie Baker in my feet. I'm like, thanks. Is this a fake account? What is this? <laughs> well, it was President Charlie Baker. I got the uh, good fortune of interviewing uh, on the Stag Bowl sideline last yep. year. Uh, but, uh, you know, that that's a great moment. But I would honestly take the surprise factor over a tweet going out for 240,000 times, because I think it's more important sometimes to have that feeling to, to make you feel like, you know, you had a great season. Here's a chance. Here's a chance. Instead of Frank Rossi, who the hell is he? And I hate that anyway, <laughs> story, a lot of people say just, you, you know, poking that surprise at you on Twitter. I, I feel bad that on a Saturday night that some of these teams were celebrating big wins on senior days and stuff like that. Here I am, the uh, Grim Reaper of yeah. football, telling you, yeah, sorry, you didn't make it. The Grinch that I stole the, the playoffs. Coaches, yeah, coaches come out on Sunday to, have to tell us their feelings about it. It, it. it felt a little morbid at times, but we also felt a duty, as you yeah. said. We want to be transparent. We felt a duty to talk about what went wrong here uh, with certain things, what needs to be fixed, and put it into the coaches' own words out of their own mouths as well that uh, both – benefited and got screwed by the whole thing no i think those are good points and yeah there's there is a duty there to document and to provide coverage right and it's like you know what would you be if you saw that and then just tried to ignore it i mean i'm sure um i can't say exactly but from your perspective that would be like i don't even know what trying to hold on to a grenade when the pin is pulled like having that information at your hands and just like sitting on that would be a, that would be a tough one i mean that's that's tough but we'll move forward and i wanted to the other uh, bull series i wanted to mention the open doors bull series is one that i've uh, just started to learn about these last couple of weeks a little bit and i'm obviously late to the party on that one but talk to me about this you've got some of the highest ranked teams that obviously don't make uh, the 40 team tournament out of four different conferences and and this year's matchups certainly feature uh, some solid squads we play we've seen play some meaningful football this year talk to me about what you know about the uh, open door series well, it, it, what I know about it is it's uh, besides the Cousin Subs Bowl and the uh, the the, the, um, the Isthmus Bowl, yep. um, the Culver's Isthmus Bowl, uh, you know, the, the Midwest Bowls were lacking. And this bowl series uh, tries to get into the Midwest more. Obviously, the pack is more of Pennsylvania Conference. Yes. Uh, but it, 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 it's at least giving opportunities to these conferences out there that just haven't had the bowl opportunities. And, uh, you know, a Wabash, what would Wabash have known about playing in, you know, a, a bowl game? Exactly. But, you know, they have that opportunity now. And uh, it's really good schools uh, across the board. Uh, taking the pack uh, obviously takes a little bit of the uh, possibilities out of the ECAC Bowl. So now we're spreading a little thin on uh, how we're working some of these bowl situations. But, you know, long story short, this Open Door Series is exciting because it is matching up conferences that don't have a plethora of uh, some of these of out-of-conference games they can play. The pack had none. Uh, yeah. OHC has one, for instance, and uh, giving them that opportunity in reality. So that, that's why I like what I see from something like that out there. 100%. And that PAC conference is one that um, I don't think Jimmy and I have given enough credit over the last uh, season here. That conference has been all over the place. And a couple of those teams we'll talk about in just a second that made it into the playoffs, Carnegie clinching the, the conference title. But you talked about Grove City earlier on, and you got a squad, a couple more squads there that have been making uh, a lot of noise. So let's get into the playoffs. First year now with an expanded field, 40 teams, 28 conference winners, then the 12 at large is obviously an increase from years past which feels like maybe a step in the right direction, uh, depending on who you ask. And, uh, you know, when you talk about this, the biggest changes, I think the obvious one for me, at least from an outside perspective looking in, is that pseudo play-in round. Would you kind of agree with that in that regard? Yeah. It, it, unfortunately, the way it got characterized and the way it got played out, unfortunately, were two different things. Because yep. it was supposed to be basically 7 and 8 against the uh, 2 seed and 9 and 10, the winner of that, <clears throat> against the 1 seed. Or so We were calling it 7A, 7B uh, versus the 2, and 8A, 8B versus the 1. 
and we saw mishmashes all over the place again because of geography yep so you end up some with some real anomalies and we were hoping that they would stay true to the idea that the top 24 teams would get buys mm -hmm. we've got a team as uh, good as 21 that is going to be playing that opening round, that first round game. That'd be and Endicott, correct? That would be Endicott. And center in the 30s yeah. gets the bye. And so uh, it, it didn't play out the way we were hoping. Some of it avoidable, some not. Always avoidable if they're willing to put money into flights, but you know how that works. Of course. And so uh, it is what it is, I guess, but yeah, we will still flag and let the NCAA know you screwed over a couple teams in this process of doing this. I hear you. And you had mentioned on your show when I was listening and the idea of doing the bracket, but after playing these quote unquote playing games, right, of making these teams uh, go out and find the results and then putting that into this overall seating and kind of going with a more quote unquote traditional tournament from there on out. What makes that uh, kind of a, an appealing idea from your perspective? For me, uh, you would avoid the necessity of Mount Union versus John Carroll in round two again yep. uh mary harden baylor harden simmons in round two again uh or even endicott uh courtland in round two which is a rematch from last year's yep. you know, early round game first round for courtland and endicott last year uh type of thing it, it would allow for some better creativity because you would have the known locations ultimately so you could actually do the geography for the 500 miles a little bit easier in that situation i I, I know nobody else does that anymore. I know that's not the way they work brackets uh, per se, but in a situation like this where you only have eight of these playing games, uh, more or less, you know, this closest thing we have to it is the 68 team division one basketball tournament, but they yeah. can afford to fly these teams wherever they want because it's division one. We don't have that ability. So we have these, as they use in a wrestling term and Logan Hansen used to say the pigtails basically uh, kind of uh, branching out there. And if you're not going to be able to utilize these pigtails well, then maybe there's a different approach you can use to still have 40 teams qualify, still call it the playoffs, but then form the base bracket later on. It, it, I'm not thrilled with the suggestion I'm making myself, but I also see the potential need for it to avoid some of these weird anomalies that it seems like we're repeating past errors that we thought we had rectified in the first place, like these conference rematches. Yeah, I think you kind of hit it on the head earlier, too, with the conceptually versus the execution of maybe how this was actually rolled out, where, you know, in theory, some of this may have made sense. And now, um, given the geographical struggles or the financial struggles, some of those things, there are these obstacles that uh, interfere with that concept and the actual execution and the rollout of maybe some of the some of the ideas hidden there. And uh, I think some major takeaways from this uh, that I've seen from the Twitter X universe the biggest one that I of all over my timeline, at least Cortland and North Central, their latest meeting being in the quarterfinals is one that has been very tough to stomach for a lot of people. And if you watched last year's championship game, I cannot blame them at all. I uh, look, I, I said it a while back uh, when, you know, I was fearful this type of thing might happen. I wanted to try to flag it to the committee. I think they uh, got my flag about the fact that Co shouldn't have been hosting against Bethel, and they did fix that this morning uh, from wh what I saw after we yes, kind of went I did see that. Rate about that. But, uh, you know, the idea was that, okay, the protected top eight means that they will all be ones and twos. And one, two, three, four, you know, one seats, five, six, seven, eight, two seats. What it did not say was you had to put them against the natural, you know, one versus eight, four versus five type of approach. For some reason, they felt the necessity to do that. And what it did was put number four, Cortland, against number five, North Central. Yeah. And you look at it, and you're like, you didn't have to do this. And honestly, in the old days, if both of last year's Stag Bowl uh, players or teams went 10-0 and 0 the next year, they would try to find every way to keep them on either side of the bracket. Of course. And you know, make it another stag bowl possibility. The worst case would be in the semifinals, at least get them out of the same quad quadrant mm -hmm. with each other. I don't get this. I don't get why they felt the need. JB called it lazy bracketing. And I, I, I know a lot of these guys, I interact with them all the time in terms of the coaches and ADs that are on these committees over the years. 
And I, I don't like to use that wording, but this was lazy bracketing. It really was because there's no rule requiring this. They could have taken that pod and moved it, you know, basically with another pod uh, and not really done much injustice to this whole thing. So this didn't need to happen. It shouldn't happen. Everybody and his brother's going to go cover the game if it does come to fruition. Yep. We got to get there first. But I mean, I, I just it sends the wrong message and this dedication to the numbers that MPI is spitting out to that degree, but then to basically just trample over the rest of the numbers when it came to the situation like Endicott uh, versus center and all that stuff. It, it, we're just picking and choosing here how we follow MPI. And yeah. I understand it's the first year of it in the first year of the 40 year uh, 40 team situation, but th th it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that not all of this was working out correctly and could have been avoided. I hear you there. Consistency is the name of the game. And if you're going to follow those metrics and um, that should be with a, you know, the algorithmic formulaic way of, of kind of putting this together, you would think that consistency would be at the forefront since it's, you take a lot of the human equation, you know, that take it out of the picture. And it'd be very interesting to see if how soon uh, division two goes to that metric and that model, because now you have a super region three that we talk about all the time. And you look at teams, uh, Ferris, Grand Valley, Harding, Pitt state, and they're all stuck in this same region. And the latest they can meet is in that regional final. And of course the D two committee, um, they can use the idea and, really the excuse of that, well, it's it's the geographic regions and that's just the way it is right now. But uh, since you're not kind of handcuffed or limited to that idea here in the same sense, I mean, obviously geographic things come to play. It's, it is certainly, it's tough to stomach. Now, uh, kind of the last one for you in the playoffs, the heavy hitting contests in round two. So after this quote unquote plan, you got Platteville and Wartburg, Susquehanna and Hobart, Johns Hopkins, Grove City, any of those uh, more intriguing than the rest in your mind? Well, even I, I don't want to leave out Springfield, Mass Dartmouth, the Battle of Ten and O teams. Very fair. Uh, I, 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 that that's number uh, what ten and number fourteen or something yeah. like that. I, I believe going against each other in the MPI rankings. So that that's something else. Uh, but uh, that Johns Hopkins Grove City game does flag itself as uh, you know can't miss uh, scenario. I mean Hobart, Susquehanna. I I. I <laughs> this is the JB uh, hater in me. Uh, I was going to say he's not on the show, so you you could speak freely. I, I look. I'm thrilled for Hobart because Kevin DeWall is friend. Uh, you know, over the years from things, but this is just this is a definite jump for them. But look, it's Hobart. You, you, you never count them out. I've learned that uh, it, for what DeWall learned from Mike Craig in the old days. I'm sure uh, the Riverboat Gambler uh, Mike Craig was uh, you know rubbed off a little bit on Kevin enough that they can win games like these if they stay close uh, late enough. So. That'll be interesting. Uh, Hope Aurora. Uh, I, I, I want to see if I'm right about Aurora being a different team from what I saw in week two when they hosted North Central and really didn't look very good in that game at yeah. any point in time. I, I think they really are. I, I, and I said it that night. I said if that, that game was played in week 10, it would be a much closer, much different game. But because they were so out of sync because they had some new moving parts on that team, Aurora just didn't come out the same way you would have hoped uh, in that game. And speaking of hope, uh, you know, hope 10-0, uh, you know, they, they had to play an MIAA that I think was a little down this year. Alma yeah. was in Alma at, at certain points. But again, you can't tell how good hope is until they play a game like this. So I really do want to see what comes to be in that game. Yeah, we had the chance to have, uh, well, no pun intended, to have Chance Strickland on the show uh, just a few weeks back. That was poor wordplay and not intentional. But uh, we really enjoyed him and, and watching him play, like you said, uh, in a conference that historically has had some solid squads. Albion's been on the down the last couple of years. You lose Dusty to, to Northwood. And then the Alma team that I got to see in person this year in the camp here and played at the Superior Dome that uh, still had some really great pieces offensively. Uh, when you graduate your entire defense, there's going to be some question marks and some holes for that Alma squad and them missing the playoffs. Was not on my bingo card at the start of the year, but as you kind of watch them play and, and throughout the conference play, it started to, it started to make sense. So... We'll see. I'm excited. I'm definitely excited and hopefully that uh, hopeful that we can get on campus and, and cover some of this in person. I really do. Um, but finally, what can we expect from, from you and JB for those listening that maybe aren't familiar with you guys coming on the pipeline and uh, when it comes to coverage, where can they find it? Well, you know, another new thing is the ESPN Plus uh, situation, and we yes. are sure what 
we're going to be able to exactly show uh, rights wise. We already had the conversation. The NCA uh, feels they don't own it sufficient to give us rights to do anything with it, but they're going to put us in touch to see what we can do. But uh, we'll still be covering in some way, shape, or form. We'll still uh, have shows each week. Still have preview shows at least on Fridays. Good and stuff. to the degree we can produce crunch time, we'll do it on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, as usual. This week, maybe not uh, exactly right when we want it because we're still kind of sleep deprived uh, for the last <laughs> few days. But you can find us on Twitter at, at D3FB Huddle or on Facebook at, uh, I believe, D3 Huddle if you're looking for the shortcut to it. But if you type in in the D3FB Huddle, oh, you yeah. will find us there. Uh, as well and uh, it, it, we were also on uh, Instagram JB has uh, got us on there at, at D3FB Huddle as well so y- you can find us on all social media that's our uh, site where we go we are also on Apple Podcasts the audio still goes out there we had some great numbers on uh, just the audio only uh, for awesome. uh, the last week or two so uh, people are interested in this stuff Kobe and I, I just want to say to you You've been doing some phenomenal work out there. I know you've been working to get better and better uh, each season with you, your content and everything, and it's working. Keep up the good work because Appreciate it's that. noticeable. You are in the vernacular out there for sure. For, uh, for you know the players and the coaches, they talk about you all the time when I'm out in the road, and that's to your credit because uh, it's not an easy space to get your name out there for the yeah. right reasons, and you've done that. That means a lot, man. Thank you very much. I know the. Of course, with me, you know, being in the grand scheme of things, especially compared to you guys newer out here, and it took a lot of while for people to get over the name. And once you do that, then it becomes, you know, it becomes a sense of appreciation. It's just getting over that hurdle. So um, I, I do appreciate that a lot, and I'm excited to to see what I can, you know, pour into this over at least the next the this playoff run, and then from there, you know, we'll see. But thank you so much for your time, man. I su- truly do appreciate it. Have a good rest of your night. You as well, and thank you for uh, inviting me on. It was a really, really great pleasure for me. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. I'll see ya. All right, we talked a lot about the D3 playoff bracket with Frank Ross, and we're going to do a little bit more of that, but uh, we're going to start, Jimmy, with some recaps from this last week. I think um, this is kind of a weird time of year because the playoffs come out and everyone just drops everything they're doing. Rightfully so. It's very important, but uh, still had some very good football played this weekend, my friend. Yeah, yeah, we're here to recap it for you. So, uh, obviously... <laughs> Our first one being Carnegie Mellon, the featured Division One Rejects Game of the Week. Uh, major implications on the line here. Carnegie Mellon had a, thought they had a pretty cozy 16-point lead in the second half, but Case Western battled all the way back to take the lead in the fourth quarter on an eight-yard touchdown from Alec Angelo to make it 30-29, to which is four minutes to go. But Ben Mills, in the Carnegie Mellon offense, orchestrated a 12-play, 63-yard touchdown drive in just two minutes and 39 seconds. Mills... Took it in from about uh, two yards out. He got it done on the ground. And they also converted a critical two-point conversion to extend the lead from five to seven points, which is just humongous, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, Case Western had one drive, uh, one last drive, and made it all the way down to the Carnegie Mellon 31 before they turned it over on down. So they got it back with enough time, but they just couldn't punch it in. And uh, Carnegie Mellon takes their four-game win streak into the first playoff game against Center. So that should be a good one for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely will be interesting. And uh, center, it sounds like talking with Frank has is seemingly snuck their way out of the bye and get or snuck their way into a bye rather, and and gets in there, which has uh, been a point of contention for a lot of people looking the bracket. But uh, this game in particular, the academic bowl, is not one that I had heard too much about, uh, and that's just on me. This has been a really good football game. That Jimmy, this has gone on. For a very long time. We're talking all the way back here uh, to 1986 in the, in the modern history of this game. And uh, it, it says here that predating the Academic Bowl, the trophy name, Carnegie Tech first played Case Tech in 1907 in Western Reserve in 1909. And then they would play a couple different times over the course of the next couple of decades. And um, this game has been kind of a trophy game for them the last going on 40 years now which is a really, really cool deal down there in the pack. And um, that's on me, and, and I'm assuming on us, judging by your reaction, that we just didn't know maybe enough about this one. It, it certainly lived up to the bill this year. And this was a game that, like you said, had some really big playoff implications tied to that. This is the the Tartans' their 10th pack title in the history of their program. And, and this is a team that, you know, after last year, Grove City kind of snatched it away from them. And, and how are they going to rebound? How are they going to respond? Because they have been the perennial power inside of the President's Athletic Conference. And uh, we talked about earlier, we have not been giving this conference enough credit. This conference this year has been 
very, very deep. I mean, you look down, I'll have to pull up the actual standings uh, to take a look at what that looks like, but the obvious ones here of Carnegie Mellon, you have Grove Cities in the playoff field, you have a Washington and Jefferson team. This conference is incredibly deep, and pulling up the standings right now, I will uh, put them up here for the people to see as well as we take a look. You can see those, Jim. And... Uh, there you have it right at the top, Carnegie Mellon, but cl followed closely. Grove City, Washington, Jefferson, all sitting at 9-1 and one is incredible. And then you drop down, you got a 7-win Westminster team, who also, I believe, is in the 40-team field. Case Western Reserve right on the outside looking in there at 6-4. And, and, and this would have been a win for Case Western and the Spartans that could have actually made an argument to try and get into the dance crazy enough uh, if they had taken down the Tartans in this game. So definitely worth mentioning. Wanted to make sure we covered that one. Let's talk about one that hits close to home for you, Platteville, playing against Stout. This one, for you guys, coming into it, that had the opportunity for you guys to come in and get the automatic qualifier, or so it seemed. Now, the way things shook out across the rest of the WAC, it seemed like that might have maybe changed a little bit, but nonetheless, talk about this game you know, in singularity. Um, so we obviously, we go down and score right away. We have a seven, seven and a half minute drive to start the game. We're all going crazy. Like we got, like, we got this, we got this. And like, obviously like, you know, Pueblo a really, really good football team and they showed it on Saturday. I mean, they they made the big plays in the big moments. I mean, they converted on several fourth downs late in the game. Uh, Brant Stair with four touchdowns. I mean, that kid's just a stud. I mean, you gotta just tip the cap. Uh, Premium made some huge plays, third and fourth down. Just kept getting out of pressure, like finding guys in the end zone. I mean, I think I think they might have scored three touchdowns on fourth down. I'd have to look at that, but okay. I mean, it was just just back breaking play after back breaking play. It was killing us. And then uh, we ended up hit, cutting it to eight, and uh, we just didn't get the onside kick at the end of the game, which was brutal. But uh, yeah, it was a back and forth game for a while. Uh, we had the lead in the fourth quarter for a bit, and then they just kind of pulled away. Yeah, unfortunately. I hear that. I'm trying to. I'm trying to go through and verify that uh, that stat for you. You think three of them were on fourth down? It, I mean, it felt like it. I mean, it just felt like we kept <laughs> we kept having them. Like I'm like third and eleven or like fourth and six, and like we just could not. Yeah, the the two first ones are both third down. There's a third and seven. Um, Stare mm -hmm. one of his touchdown catches on the day, and we've had a chance to to talk to him. He has really turned into one of the better playmakers inside of that conference. Brand Stare on the outside there for this Platteville squad, dude. What did you see out of him this week? I mean, we we had a really hard time stopping the down game, down the field, like pass game. Uh, it was just one of those things where, like, they just had guys making plays. I mean, our, our guys were giving it their best effort. We just couldn't seem to get a stop. Uh, we, we did generate a turnover. Uh, Richie Murphy had a spectacular toe-tap interception. Hunter Scaife picked it up. Right and, at the start uh, of the second half, boy, right? Yeah, our, our board, it was an opening drive of the second half. Yeah, and Richie, uh, he got, we think he got one down. They called down the field, he got one down, but yeah. we were all like, he caught that holy cow. It was an amazing play. So shout out to Richie for that. That is sweet. Yeah, I just had him back on the show, and I, I'm trying to look at, at some of these. I'm not seeing the. Yeah, I'm not I, seeing. I, I don't know. I think I was just imagining it, but like it just seemed like they were just getting every yeah. single conversion. It was just so frustrating. I mean, one of them was a third and twelve in the fourth quarter. Yeah. So that's certainly that. Yeah, that that hurts. That hurts for sure. But yeah, no. Nonetheless, um, some big time plays. They converted. It felt like when they really needed to throughout the course of this one, and um, they obviously secured the outright. WAC title, and they got some help. River Falls takes down Oshkosh, and now that River Falls squad, man, who everyone was very high on in the in the preseason, rightfully so, uh, they're left on the outside looking in, and that's not kind of what we expected here. No Whitewater, no River Falls in the national dance. The WAC, there was a ch there was talk that okay, there's a, a decent chance they get three teams in. There's an outside chance they get four teams in, and we're left with two. Yeah, I think what would have had to happen to get four, I believe, if Oshkosh would have won and we would have won, I believe that would have left us with four. But obviously that was not the case. But the Devils are going bowling. Yes, they you know, are. Got that the, is, got that is big time. Coming yep. up here. Yeah. And we had just I just talked with, with Rossi about uh, the Open Doors Bowl Series, the ECAC. Then you have um, that, uh, obviously, the Isthmus Bowl, and then the Cousins, that, like, lakefront, that subs that lakefront bowl. So there's a lot going on. So I think, um, I mean, talk about it from your perspective. That's what we were kind of saying is that I think there's a lot of people on the outside that might not see the value in, like, this extra postseason play. But talk about the attitude and the mindset from those guys in that building and, and how, I'm assuming, how excited they are to go and get to play another week. Yeah, we're pumped. And obviously, you know, we wanted to be in the playoffs, but I mean, 
this is the second best alternative for sure. I mean, we get to, we get one more week with this great group of guys. I mean, we've been battling all year. You know, if you would have told us after week one after we dropped one to Carroll by double digits that we're playing in a bowl game, we would have been pretty freaking happy. Right. You know? So you gotta take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, we're looking forward to playing a really, really good Wheaton team. And uh, there's a lot of guys from the Chicago area. So it'd be cool to uh compete against them. It definitely would. And, you know, kind of touching on that, like some of the earlier season stuff, I'm not sure if you followed any of uh, Dickinson State throughout the year. Honestly, no, I did not. I I'll tell you right now, you guys were their only loss. They're in the playoffs for the NAIA. Yeah, that's good for them, man. They're, it, the thing was, we were up 22-0, and they scored 20 points in the fourth quarter, and it was just a – oh, man, that was a sweat. I tell you what. No, I yeah, absolutely They're, they're a great do. football that, team. It doesn't surprise me that they're 9-1 and at all. Yeah, that, that squad, they turned it up uh, over the second half of the, the season, and they, they really got things going. Shout out to D3 Zone, by the way, for those cut-ups uh, of that last game. I got some highlights here from KARE 11, St. John's and Bethel in the MIAC, MIAC? I mean, I don't even, the MIAC championship uh, here. And this was this was a big-time game, Jimmy. Talk to me about this one. Yeah, so uh, late in the fourth quarter, Bethel brought the game within one score and a touchdown from Joey Kidder, but uh, St. John's quickly responded with a score of their own, put the game a little bit out of reach. Uh, Dylan Wheeler, touchdown with three minutes to go, thrown by a familiar face, the guy we talked about it a lot on here, Aaron Syverson. Yep. He uh, continues to personify Allen Iverson with all the dimes he's been dropping. <laughs> 419 through the air, five touchdowns. It's a really, really good Bethel defense, that should be known. Um Huge rivalry victory, obviously, over Bethel. Uh, getting them a first round by St. John's generated four forced fumbles, recovering three of them. And in games like these, winning the turnover battle is crucial, you know, and that unfolded before our eyes on Saturday. But yeah. Bethel's season is far from over. They're in the dance. They're taking on Co and Kobe. There was a little bit of controversy about where this game Dude. was played. Hear about that? Yes, and there was a mistake because of the seeding that Bethel should have been in front of. The, they're the higher seed. They should have been hosting. It was announced incorrectly and then rectified earlier today. So Bethel will be hosting that uh, that first round matchup. Yeah, that's got to be a, that's a head scratcher, man. I would be. I don't know how I'd feel about that. <laughs> you know, it's just oof. imagine uh, from Coast's perspective in that. Huge. Holy cow! Well, holy shit! More like we get to host again, and then actually, by the way, mm. get ready to get on the bus. <laughs> I will mention, though, St. John's got a pretty tough draw. I don't know if you saw the bracket. I did. Being that, I mean, any given Saturday, but lacrosse takes on Northwestern. And I think lacrosse is going to win that game pretty convincingly. And I don't know, man. Being a a number one seed taking on – or a team getting a bye taking on lacrosse is your first game. Like, that's tough, dude. Yeah, that that definitely hurts. And those top seeds are supposed to be, quote-unquote, kind of protected in some of these these ways. And and that certainly does not seem to be the case, to your point. And assuming lacrosse handles business, which seems to be the general consensus against the Northwestern squad there. But – you know, it'd be very interesting. And you go back to this this uh, St. Paul or St. John's, excuse me. That's St. Paul's Northwestern. You go back to this game, though, and you're talking about a, a game where there was 31 points scored in the fourth quarter alone for both these teams that I stepped did, it up. Yeah. Their offenses towards the end of this one really got going. There was three points scored in the first quarter and 31 in the fourth. That is a, yeah, just kind of a wild, I think, metric there. Almost 9,000 people in attendance for this one. Um, the biggest number on the day you had talked about, uh, Cyberson or Severson, I've heard both. Um, but Aaron, he has been balling. And, and you know, they had 419 yards passing on the day. Their rushing yards, though, is net negative nine. I did see that. Yeah, uh, because, like, their net total yards was 410. I'm like, wait, Cyberson threw for 419. And then I looked, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. That's and ridiculous. it's not like they didn't try. Like, there's a lot of teams that just yeah. air the ball out, that throw the ball a bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, they attempted it 44 times through the air. They had 27 carries in the ground, and you finished with yeah. negative yardage. And that is a, a testament to that Royals defense, which you talked about earlier. They were absolutely stifling. And they had some good success in the ground as well. Bethel did 4.6 yards per carry, finished with 137 on the ground. But uh, to hold this Johnny's offense, which has not really been known for their rushing attack, but to hold them to that number, any kind of quality opponent is uh, is really impressive. Not too many big takeaways. Nothing else, I think, that really stands out metric-wise here. Um, when you look at the red zone, both teams were very efficient in finishing off their drives. St. John's was 4-4, Bethel 4-5, and uh, a, a very deserving champion here in St. John's, I think, is, is kind of the short of it. Yeah, for sure. And then going back on the name pronunciation, 
It probably is Severson, but I like calling him Severson just because it sounds like Allen Iverson. So, <laughs> and like, if you're listening, I like that. Know that I, it's, it's not out of disrespect. I just like doing the Iverson thing, you know. I think he'll accept it, bro. I don't think yeah. I don't think he minds. But sure. I don't know the dude, but I, yeah, if he got a problem, either, he can yeah. let us know. <laughs> That's good. Let's move over and talk about this UMass Dartmouth squad that uh, offensively has been putting up some really impressive numbers. They get out of this one against Plymouth State, a pretty close, narrow margin of victory, 47-42, Jim. Yeah, and uh, that was due to the dominant run game by uh, UMass Dartmouth. They had 200-plus yard rushers in this one. You can believe that. Uh, Kevin Brown and Jalen Aponte both having – they both had exactly 133 rushing yards too, which was pretty weird. I don't know if you saw that in the box score, but having two yeah. guys with the same amount of rushing yards is pretty dope. But uh, sealing up a perfect 10-0 regular season over Plymouth State in absolute slugfest, UMass Dartmouth converted four, on fourth down four times. I can confirm that. Yeah. But it's, that, is, that is true. They had four fourth down, four down conversions. I know I had a faulty stat earlier, but I think I uh, – <laughs> my emotions got the best of me, I think, because there was just so many – it just seemed like they just kept getting long conversions and long conversions. But, no, anyway, there actually was four fourth down conversions in this game so yeah totally and you look at this graphic here um it, this team has done really well as of late inside of the conference 2022 23 and 24 champions the corsairs have been on quite a roll when you look at their season stats throughout the course of this year we're talking 54 points per game from this umass dartmouth squad they've been holding opponents to less than 16 almost 550 yards per game of total offense and it's been a very split effort uh, offensively, which I think is very much uh, worth noting here in that they have 263 through the air per game and 251 on the ground. This is probably the most balanced passing and rushing offense in all of D3 football right now. And the Corsairs have been doing it at a very high level over the course of the season. And when you look at their schedule, I think the knock might be the strength of schedule potentially when you look at some of these games uh, that they've played earlier on. Uh, there haven't really been any close ones. Uh, I think their their most narrow margin of victory before this game, of course, Plymouth State was Western Connecticut, which they won by eleven. But other than that, they were blowing teams out throughout the entire course of this year. And I think um, you know Framingham State has been a team that's had a lot of success over here in the uh, the Mascac, but uh, they just have struggled as of late. So uh, for me. Again, I'm going to give the Corsairs all the flowers in the world right now because of just the things and the numbers they've been able to produce and what they've been able to show. But this Springfield matchup for me is very, very intriguing. How is this team going to match up against the Springfield attack that uh, I think has started to earn a lot more respect across the, the D3 landscape? Yeah, they're going to have to lean on that balanced offense and effectively running the ball and setting it up, like running good. If you run the ball really well, you can set up like play action, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, I did see that being that both teams are 10-0, they gave the home field advantage to Springfield, which kind of stinks. Like that they're ten and zero, and they have to go on the road for a playoff game. But yeah. obviously, they avoid that first round technically. So they're playing. They're not playing until the thirtieth, but uh, they'll have a little time off here, get some practicing in. But uh, no, this should be a good one. I'm excited to see how the this game is. Uh, what the spread looks like for this one, the Hanson ratings. I have not looked at those yet, but uh, I'm really intrigued to see it. No, I'm with you, dude. Um, going down the list. Some other big-time games that are certainly worth bringing up here. Um, I watched this one from start to finish, the Cortica Jug game. Cortland bringing it to Ithaca, 28-17. Zach Boys, our guy, he looked pretty lethal in this one, dude. He was doing it all on the ground with his legs, too, and I think that's been an underappreciated part of his game. But if you watched their playoff run last year, you saw him get out of the pocket and get absolutely busy against some really good defenses. So a really strong showing from that Cortland squad and a, and a uh, a rivalry type of environment. Endicott blows out Curry. And then you have uh, Grove City, who put on, I think, an underrated, really great performance against the Westminster team that has seven wins on the year. 36-9, to nine, Grove City takes that one. Uh, Hope finished out their MIAA schedule, 48-12 to 12 over Olivet. And you keep going down the list. We did have a kind of a, a, not kind of, we had an upset Alfred taking down Brockport 23-14 over there. And that's the Empire 8. Correct, and, and this Brockport team that just lost barely to this uh, Cortland squad a week ago, it's it's a dangerous game when you start playing the who beat who, but that is a very, very big win for that Alfred squad. And, uh, of course, we cannot go out without mentioning uh, that Monon Bell game. Did you get the chance to watch any of that? I saw the clips on Twitter. Obviously, I was a little bit busy. 
on Saturday. But, I'm uh, no, sure I didn't mean really live, cool. of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, uh, DePaul, uh, they pull out that one, 42-21 over Wabash. And it, that environment, Jimmy, was second to none. And, and Frank Rossi and I talked about that. That was one of the cooler D3 football setups I've seen. And and I've been in MetLife in front of 40-some thousand people for the Cortica Jug game a few years ago. That, that place was rocking. And uh, then finally, uh, Mount Union. Another semi-close game here. They take on Muskingum, and 35-28 is the final there. Uh, John Carroll pulls out ahead of Marietta, 49-35, and another upset that earns John Carroll uh, a bid into the playoffs. That is a very big-time win for that squad. In other notes, I think we've kind of covered the big ones. We talked about River Falls earlier on in UW Oshkosh. That was obviously a huge win for this River Falls squad, just not enough to get them into the dance. Potentially playing spoiler, though, for that UW Oshkosh, Oshkosh team, excuse me. Yeah, Oshkosh had a really good resume. They had a lot of good wins. Uh, they Obviously, they beat Linfield and Wheaton in the non-conference. But, uh, yeah. yeah, man, they just it just kind of stinks for them. Because, like, obviously, you want to – being in the WIAC, you want to see WIAC teams get in. But, like, if they beat us last week, like, they're in. And, like, obviously, you know, it is what it is. But if I was cheering for Oshkosh in that game, for sure, because I, I know a couple guys on the team. So that was obviously a bummer for those guys. But, uh, yeah, River Falls is solid. I mean, they, they've had a lot of adversity this year, obviously losing Blaha. But uh, I've been hearing rumors that he's getting a med red. So I think he might be coming back. That's not confirmed. Just yep. This is what I've been hearing through the grapevine. Speculation so. here on, on I don't D1R. Want to I, I want to personally anything. would be a big fan of that. Having uh, you know had a talk with him and, and being able to see him play, I would be all in. Yeah, kid's a baller, man. You know, you hate to see a guy go down – and potentially his last year. So, I mean, hopefully. And that's what really hurts, too. And, and their coach is talking about it in the huddle with uh, with Frank and JB and that it wouldn't hurt so much if River Falls didn't think they had a squad that could go and do it all. And, and with Caleb under center there, with Blaha calling the, calling the shots, so to speak, that top gun offense that they have over there in River Falls, that really was a team that I, I don't think anyone wanted to draw in a playoff, playoff game, excuse me, when he was under center. Now, they played three or four different quarterbacks and really were just trying to th- figure things out offensively as they got going throughout the course of the season. And they have other great playmakers, but when you lose that shot caller under center there, that play caller, it's, that's really tough to, to overcome. But looking at this, this playoff bracket, Jim, what else jumps out at you? I know uh, Frank and I had talked about Cortland and North Central being kind of in that, in that same pool in that same bracket, which was not very encouraging. But uh, anything else jump out to you here? Any games you're really looking forward to in that first round? Uh, I think it's obviously the John carroll Monte joseph matchup is interesting because if John Carroll wins, they get a crack at Mount Union. Yes. So that'll be a super cool one because I remember they played him pretty tough, if I remember correctly, early on in the season. They did, and there's there's good and bad to that, right? Of like bad, or we don't really want to see another rematch here like that early on. But also to the fact of of John Carroll, like, hey, let's get another sh- a shot at this Mount Union Purple Raider team that uh, maybe we can get them when it counts. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I um, think though, I think, looking yeah, at the uh, the Texas matchup, how about Trinity and UMHB in that first round? Yeah, I was just about to say Mary Harden Baylor right now. They're catching a lot of hate for only having three quote unquote D three wins on the year, three or four, whatever it was, and, and using kind of abusing maybe some of the metrics to get in there into the dance. But I think a, a win against a quality Trinity team would shut a lot of that up immediately. Not to saying it will happen. I just that would do a lot for that uh, Crusader team. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, on the other end of it, or get down a couple games in the bracket. Going into the second round, technically, it would be Johns Hopkins and Grove City. I think that's going to be a tremendous football game as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot I mean, of good matchups here. And then, obviously, you got Platteville and Wartburg, too. There's a lot of good ones. A lot of good that ones. is ridiculous, the fact that I we mean, that football so early on. That's a really unlucky draw for both teams. I mean, man, oh, man. That, that, that region, the top left region, I think, is the strongest region in the bracket, in my opinion. Joining the show to discuss the NAIA playoff picture, good friend Matt Schwarzler. Hey, fella. What's going on, man? Dude, you tell me. Yeah, <laughs> I've been I'll so worried me. about this this D2 and D3 playoff setup that um, admittedly NAI is kind of taking a backseat in my mind and uh, reading over some of it just tonight and, and a little bit of yesterday. It has, uh, it's been pretty eye-opening. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, unfortunately I couldn't make it, you know, the previous week, right? That's kind of how that worked. I didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I honestly can't remember anymore, dude. I last week was such a blur for work um <laughs> anyways um but yeah the nai playoff picture is looking really interesting they announced all 20 teams today mm-hmm. um and there were some important games last week that had some decent implications for the actual playoffs and i feel like we should mention them before we get into the actual rankings totally uh, first definitely want to bring up georgetown's win over Lindsay wilson 
um, getting a big mid-south win to kind of solidify their spot. Lindsey Wilson, it was really their last shot to get into the playoff, even at an outside chance. But uh, yeah, Lindsey Wilson ending the year five and four, not exactly where they they wanted to be in yeah. Georgetown, kind of pulling ahead. Pretty solid game from them. They had a pretty impressive second half as a, they were tied in halftime and locked it down in the second half there against Lindsey Wilson. But yeah, Georgetown looks as good as ever. They look ready for a playoff run, man. They do, and 6-0 and inside a conference play. You see here, uh, I guess I'll move the photo over, but um, obviously getting that bid uh, down there, winning the Mid-South, and um, this team did incredibly well inside a conference. They do have the two losses outside a conference, but then again, you look back at the schedule and you look at those two losses. I know the one was, I believe, the season opener against Montana Tech, and then it was Alabama mm -hmm. A&M. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> you look at those two squads these teams have fallen to, and I'll double-check the – the margin of victory there, I don't believe it was much, and it was not. They lost by seven uh, at Montana Tech to open the year. And even that game against a Division One Alabama A&M opponent was an eight-point game. So you're talking about two mm -hmm. one-score games against some really quality opponents for this Georgetown squad and a team that remained perfect inside of conference play, um, even against some squads that uh, we've been really high on. Campbellsville came onto the scene this year and made a really big jump from years prior, finishing at 9-2 and two overall, and then a Bethel squad that we didn't really know what we were going to uh, get from them. You look at Cumberland, and um, the, the middle of this squad, or this conference, excuse me, got messy, but you got four seven-win teams inside of the Mid-South mm -hmm. overall. That's, that's pretty telling. Yeah, it, it was a really good year and a really competitive year for the Mid-South in what is usually like a two- or three-horse race, so that was really fun to see. We'll obviously get more into those details as we kind of talk about how the playoff shaped out. But a big win for Georgetown. Lindsey Wilson gets bumped out. Georgetown is in with the win. And we jump to uh, the frontier here, man. Frontier going to frontier. That's mm. all I have to say about that. Because uh, College of Idaho getting a big upset after a pretty down stretch to their season over ranked Southern Oregon in overtime. A 27-24 win. And Southern Oregon entirely bounced out of the playoff picture because of this game, which is unfortunate Unreal. for them. They've had a great season, but man... Got to be able to put it together at the end. Southern Oregon obviously getting some scores on the board towards the end of the game. But, uh, man, this was this was an impressive showing for College of Idaho and uh, very promising for their uh, upcoming campaign next season. Southern Oregon's got to be kicking themselves, man. You're, you're a three-loss team. Um, you just about survived a good chunk of that gauntlet that we talk about in the frontier and uh, just couldn't pull it through in the end. It's... Uh, it's 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 sad for them, but they've also had a very good season, and I don't think many people expected Southern Oregon to be in the position that they were in in the first place. So uh, so kudos to them, but this one's got a sting. They definitely have some uh, motivation going into next year. No, hundred percent. This Yotes team that was shut out in the first half shows up in a big way in the second half and got some things done. And um, on the highlights there, you saw one of the takeaways through the air, a big-time interception for them. That helped to turn things around. Um, they didn't win a couple of the other metrics, like the penalty battle, the total offense, uh, a lot of different places where they didn't maybe do as well. They punted the ball seven times, but they did a good job doing it, flipping the field all over the place. Um, the one metric they did absolutely destroy – Southern Oregon and time possession. And again, the, the numbers lopsided because of overtime, but almost 46 minutes to 27 of yeah. SOU. And that is, uh, that's very telling in a game like this. And when they did get in the red zone, they made the most of it five of six on scoring chances there inside of the red zone. And um, they, they weren't kicking anything in this one. Didn't even yeah. uh, attempt it. And Southern Oregon did. They, they converted three of them, but the Yotes, like you said, big time win. And that, that knocks them out of the playoff hunt. That has to hurt really bad uh, on the road and overtime loss there. Yeah, absolutely. But like I said, man, College of Idaho, way to finish strong. Move on over then. We'll stay over here uh, out west. A team in Carroll that we've talked a lot about has played so strong through the first three quarters of the year. And, and now we get here up against a quality opponent in uh, Montana Tech, and they kind of had their way with them. Yeah, Montana Tech just absolutely boat raced Carroll. Not what I was expecting from this game whatsoever. I thought this was going to be a lot closer. But man, Lander Smith looks like one of the best players in the country right now. 170 yards on the day with four touchdowns and five yards a carry for him. And Blake Thielen having a decent day too, going 15 for 17 mm -hmm. for 196 and two touchdowns and a pick. 
Uh, this was just a dominant showing from Montana Tech. Their offense showed out. Their defense was really good against a Carroll offense that's been pretty good for most of the year. So yes. it was uh, – they solidified that they are one of the top two teams in the frontier. Carroll obviously – not having the end of the season they would have liked um, with this loss also bounces them out of playoff contention, unfortunately. But this is a really good Montana Tech team, and they were just they're just better. I mean, this on all fronts was it was an ore diggers W. Yeah, and they opened up the year against Montana Tech and lost at home. Then you got to go do it on the road, and they, they did not fare uh, much better there. And uh, you know, shout out to Montana Sports, by the way, for the uh, the highlights and the footage. I wanted to say that. And this Carroll team, they were undefeated in Frontier Conference play just a couple weeks ago. And we previewed that big-time matchup against Montana Western that felt like it had some really big conference uh, conference implications, excuse me. And it certainly did, but not in favor of Carroll. And then you, you kind of won up that with another not-so-great showing against this Montana Tech squad. And like I said, the first three quarters of the year, they were playing some outstanding football. You look at this last four games, this stretch for Carroll and how they had to finish out the year. You're playing at number 12, College of Idaho. Then you're back at home against number 8, Southern Oregon. Back on the road for two games against number 4 and number 8, Montana Western and Montana Tech. And that is a that is a stretch that... I mean, they started off 2-0, and they finished 2-2. and It's not the way they wanted to, but um, that's a ridiculous stretch, probably one of the tougher ones across the country. Absolutely, and the fact that they come out of that the other side 2-2 and is impressive. It's just unfortunate that it has to be at the cost of their postseason, you know? Yep, so, also true. Um, so <laughs> they're, they're a good squad. They looked really good this year, but it's the frontier, man. This conference just eats itself alive. We've seen it time and time again. It wasn't as bad this year as it's been in years previous, but man, it was it was a clock till the very end. But uh, yeah, Montana Tech pretty much solidifies that they are a playoff team like we all expected them to be. And uh, excited to see what they do in the postseason. Yes, sir. Now let's talk about a Marion squad that clinched at least part of the MSFA, that Midwest Co-Championship. 37-28, they take the win over St. Francis, that being the Fighting Saints of Illinois, not to be confused with the Cougars up there in Indiana. Absolutely. Yeah, Marion showed up and showed out against a uh, St. Francis, Illinois team that was on the outside looking in on the playoff. And Marion just showed up and did well and beat them straight up. Like, that's just how it was. Uh, they kind of dominated the first half. They uh, had it close through the first quarter, and then they just started running up the score. They were up 24 to 7 at half, I believe, or 24 to 14, mm -hmm. something like that. And then, uh, you know, it's it's U.S. Excuse me. USF is storming back into it, and then Marion can kind of keep their distance. Uh, yeah. Solid performances across the board. I mean, the man Marion. of the game is on the screen right now. Yeah. Keegan LaBelle. <laughs> Keegan LaBelle. That stat wow. line that he put together, 40 carries, first of all, is a metric mm. that maybe should not be a thing. I don't know how physically how you put up with that. That's impressive in and of itself. But yeah. to have 290 yards and four tuds to go with that, with he had a, one that he broke off for 81 yards on the day. It's a ridiculous stat line and, and a very big reason of why they were able to have that success. Yeah. I mean, it, it just came down to the rushing game because uh, Keegan the Bell is playing lights out and Sam Tumility is the main staple of this USF squad. So it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> fantastic showing for Marion. I will say it is a bummer that we don't get to see this Marion team in the playoff. Yeah. We'll, we'll kind of mention that down the line. They don't get in. They've had a sneaky like rebound to their year. They went nine and two. They ended the year pretty solid mm -hmm. uh, for where we kind of had them starting out as a bit shaky. So uh, way to put it together for the Knights here in, a, in an impressive win on the road, no less. Um, good for them, man. Yep, they dominate time possession, 35 and a half minutes of this one. They struggled mm -hmm. on third down, 4 of 12 there, so not exactly the best metric, and they did have two interceptions they had to overcome on the day, two takeaways that their defense actually kind of equalized because they pulled down two of their own. So this game was seemingly, again, I didn't get to tune into it, but seemingly a lot of back and forth uh, mm -hmm. for these two squads, and, and Marion felt like just had the ball at the end of it and were able to, to take advantage of it. But uh, let's move over to the actual playoff field, my friend. First round matchups. We'll mm -hmm. talk about the teams that get buys in just a second. There are uh, 12 of them. But uh, let's talk about these first round matchups. we got four of them that we want to preview here. 
Yep. And keep in mind with the NAI playoff, the way it kind of shapes up is we got the 12 buys. They are all off next week. Um, but for the first round matchups, these are yours. It's 20 teams get in and it seats 13 through 20 all playing each other. Um, and then for and D3 the is not to cut you like off. A, D3 is starting to look a lot yeah. more like this too. Cause you've got mm -hmm. um, a pseudo play in round now that they've expanded the field to 40 teams. So it's interesting to, to say in the least, but it's starting to, you know, to mirror that a little bit more. Yeah, it is. It is like a pseudo plan. It, it very much resembles like just a larger version of what you see, like with March Madness, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting how some of these shook out. Um, obviously, there are some auto bids to be had. And because of these auto bids, there are a few teams that get left out of this picture that really should be contending here. Happens every year, bound to happen when you have auto bids in a system like this. So I don't, it's not like anybody's fault. It's just you got to win when it matters. With the regular Plus the season. smallest field out of the three levels. You're talking about just the number of teams that get in, right? Yeah. Now you're talking about a D3 uh, field that is literally double the field mm -hmm. of what we're talking about right now. And then even Division Two is at 28 still with the four different geographical super regions. So you combine those automatic bids with the smallest field out of the small school football levels. It's a recipe for pissing a lot of people off every year. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to that once we cover all these yeah. teams because there are some there are some pissed off people, and I I can't say I blame them too much because on paper you kind of look at it, you scratch your head, but like I said with the auto bids, it's it's always a tricky conversation, right? And uh, speaking of auto bids, in our first matchup, we got five and five Pikeville <laughs> in the playoffs yes. as the uh, AAC champion taking on the at large nine and one Baker football team. That is the 13th seed. So 20 versus 13 here. If you look at SP plus, this is Baker at 17th in the country and Pikeville at 41st. Um, so not ideal for uh, those metrics fans out there in this matchup. Absolutely. But obviously not. you win your conference and you get in. That's just how it goes. So Pikeville taking advantage of that had that goofy three-way tie going with Reinhardt and point for a little bit, but yep. they, uh, they pulled ahead. So, so they get in. And uh, Baker, obviously, with the big advantage here, they've looked really good this year. Truman Ewell's guard, man. Shout mm -hmm. out Truman. Love that guy. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I, there's no reason why Baker shouldn't be able to win this matchup. I believe they're going to be hosting, and if not, the neutral site will be close to them. So it's uh, all things pointing to Baker, but uh, Pike feels sneaky. You know, they, they've they had some performances. They have a couple guys who have really been going off recently. Yes. Um, they're, they're quarterback, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pull up the stat line right <laughs> now, and we, we're gonna post our players of the week later tonight. I mean, it's not a spoiler, or, or a, it's a gimme. Like the yeah. stat line that he put up, uh, it probably would have been Lavelle from from Marion if it wasn't for Lee Kirkland. And uh, here is the the final stat line from him this past week. Right now, 41 of 47 he was, and here's a look at it right now: 646 passing yards and 11 passing touchdowns. That ties a college football record. That's just unreal. That's that just is, unfathomable. <laughs> for a team, too, you, you mentioned that like they're 5-5. Five and five. They had a interesting start to the year. And by interesting, I mean shitty start to the year. <laughs> they started 0-4, all against Mid-South foes. And I think mm -hmm. you look at the first couple losses on, on this column here, and I don't think these are blatantly bad, so to speak. You lose by one to a Campbellsville team that at the time might have been kind of surprising, but we saw how the Tigers panned out over the course of the year. And then a Georgetown team by three points at home. Again, we're talking about how good Georgetown is. Those two losses, like, again, they're still just losses, but they're quality losses if you can put some kind of silver lining on it. But then you go at Cumberland's and you get blown out by 32 points. And then you go at Faulkner. I'm hopefully saying that one correctly. If sure, I'm Mark. not wrong, I think that was Faulkner's only win on the year. Uh, that sounds accurate. They have been actively not good. Yeah, because we just had those Mid South whatsoever. rankings pulled up. I know they were all the way at the bottom. I believe uh, for Faulkner, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that was their only win on the year against like, a team that now is going to be represented in the playoff. Like, that's a scary, a scary concept. But again, to, to their Pike's second credit, win, was they that? beat Point. Uh, Faulkner beat Point the week after. Okay, so they had two wins. That was their first win of the year, though. At that point, there you go. Then you get into to conference play, and you do pick up some quality wins. Uh, Reinhardt is obviously no slouch. Kentucky Christian, you had talked about a bit at the beginning of the year and, and given them their flowers and um, didn't quite pan out for them, but a uh, good mm -hmm. win over Bluefield and then a close loss to point. Like, they had their games, but I, I can, again, to your point, I can certainly see where the frustration would be at. A, a team like this where they stacked up out of conference is a blatant, 
blatant way of showing maybe where this team uh, stacks up compared to compared to the rest of the field. But like everything else, they'll have a chance to to prove otherwise on Saturday. Yeah, they can prove otherwise, and it, it's also not their fault that they're in the playoffs. So I think yes. we need to remember that this is not their decision, and we are <laughs> like. I'm super pumped for them. I don't want people to think that I'm like, oh, these guys suck. They should be in. <laughs> but, um, you know, like that's always the conversation you have with Otto Bits, right? And look, when you have a guy on your team that's setting records, even if you're five and five, dude, like that's something I want to watch in the playoffs yep. for sure. So uh, Pikeville can do can do the unthinkable uh, in the first round of the playoffs against Baker. Baker just looks so good to end their season, though. Not to mention that, like, that side of the – um the heart excuse me uh it's just so stacked they get all three of those teams in which we will also mention but um my goodness <laughs> yeah that is that is tough we'll keep moving forward um mm-hmm. talking about the next matchup here and uh talk to me man dickinson state and then you've got uh, a kansas wesleyan squad who i guess the point here, and I didn't know about this earlier on, Matt Myers getting rid of their head coach and, and rebounding to have the the year that they've had. And and that was one that doing a little bit of reading, that was a very interesting deal. And I guess, I, again, I was just done reading today and tried to figure out a little bit more information. I don't know all of the, the ins and outs to that. But a guy that's had a lot of success there. And this season, maybe not so much, you know, of a great start. You know, but... Uh, just very, very interesting. Coming off a very recent uh, award of assistant coach of the year in the NAI in 2021, gets promoted to head coach, eight and three in both those seasons, a co-division championship in 2021, and he's an alum. And then he, uh, then he gets canned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting situation <laughs> for them. I don't want to speak too much on that, so I'll just leave that would be. Um, but yeah, they this team is in was in a weird spot, but they've rebounded really well this year, having a very solid seven and four season for them, obviously winning their half of the KCAC, probably not the tougher side between the two, but Hey, still got to beat some decent teams to get there. Yep. And they are the 19 seed facing off against 14th seeded Dickinson state. Dickinson state has had a pretty decent year. The metrics actually like them, which is surprising. Most years they don't SB plus has this team at 11th in the country. Shout out to them. I've been very low on this team since they lost to Wisconsin Stout yeah. earlier in the season. But they've won out, and they've looked pretty solid doing it. I don't know if I'm entirely sold on them yet. I do like them to probably win this matchup against Kansas Wesleyan. I think roster-wise, they just match up better. Um, but yeah, this will this will be a very interesting game to see where both these teams are at kind of going into next season and what the outlook for their programs is. And I bet you Dickinson State can can pull away with one and get a first round win. Under and little did we know too that Stout would go on to actually have a, a really productive year. And you know oh, they were playing this yeah. last week for a potential automatic qualifier out of the whack, which makes zero sense. Again, looking at preseason, that was not on anyone's sheet. Um, but yeah, Stout would go on to have a, a really productive year and pull off some really big wins. Whitewater being on that list of some other teams inside a conference play there and. Uh, it just goes to show you, man, like a matchup like that, I didn't really think much of at the beginning of the season, and both those teams went on to have quite a bit of success. Um, outside of conference, also had some some rather large, I think some decent wins. You open up uh, against Rocky Mountain, a team that I think has earned a decent amount of respect across the field. But uh, keep it going here. How about uh, Southwestern and St. Francis? And then uh, looks like we got uh, Friends and Ottawa, Arizona. You betcha. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the mound builders first from Southwestern because this team looks fantastic after last week. They absolutely bulldozed through their last regular season game of the year uh, in impressive fashion. They obviously get the at-large bid for the uh, for their conference, but they are still in a good spot. SP Plus has them ranked fourth in the entire country. They've been that dominant this year. So uh, excited to see what that has for them. Uh, but they're facing a pretty good St. Francis, Indiana team who's no slouch. And they have had a very successful kind of end chunk to their season. Uh, metrics don't like them as much. SP Plus has them at 31st in the entire NAI. But this is a sneaky St. Francis team that has bitten a lot of teams uh, when they least expected it. And I, uh, if I'm Southwestern, I'd be careful. But I think Southwestern is kind of a wagon right now. I'm not going to lie to you, man. So okay. 
Yeah, it's uh, I, I, I like Southwestern in this, but I'd be curious to see St. Francis and how they show up to this one. I hear you there. And, you know, outside of this last week, I would say St. Francis was was quite the wagon. They had all the momentum on their side. You go back to back to back weeks uh, taking on number 18, then Marion at their place, beating them on the road. Then you come back home for the uh, Franciscan. Bull, I believe is what they coined it. Um, mm-hmm. They win that one against the quality St. Francis squad down in Illinois. Then you go and play St. Xavier, who we know has played some quality games, and you almost close it out against Olivet Nazarene and are unable to pick up that result. But uh, hopefully they take that in the way of uh, just a little more motivation. I, I think, though, before that, I mean, this this team was rolling. So it'll be interesting to see if they can pick up where they left off or if this mm-hmm. kind of goes the other way against that Southwestern squad. Finally, though, Friends, Falcons are in the dance, at least the first round of it, and they host Ottawa, Arizona. Yeah, this one is the most intriguing first round matchup for sure. Uh, Friends, two very different styles of playing football. (laughs) Yes. Um, So I am excited just for the aesthetics of this matchup alone. It's going to be very funny to see the uh, contrasting styles there. But friends, very solid team in their own right. Very good run game. And Ottawa, Arizona has just pretty much blown through most of their schedule with relative ease, only dropping one game on the year. Obviously, they only get the at-large bid. Texas Wesley had won sooner. But uh, they look really good this year. So I want to say I like friends in this, but I don't know, man. Ottawa, Arizona is, is fun, and they they do. It's fun and trendy, do, and yeah, they do they do decently in in matchups like this. So I'll take friends for now, but uh, keep your eyes on that matchup. That'll probably be the most interesting one from the first round. All right, we talked about all the first round matchups. Now the twelve teams that get buys through the first round. Starting, I'll just give the list. Starting with the reigning, defending national champion out of Florida. Kaiser at one. They go down the list. Grandview, Indiana Wesleyan, Montana Western. You've got St. Thomas also down there in Florida. Morningside, Montana Tech, Texas Wesleyan, Benedictine, Georgetown, Northwestern, and Mid-America Nazarene. So that's the the short of it. But talk to me about these squads. I guess kind of uh, maybe in that order. Yeah, so it's also with all this, remember, keep in mind that a lot of these teams aren't necessarily conference champions. St. Thomas at five there obviously is an at-large with their loss being to Kaiser. Yep. Um, But they rank the way they like it to shake out is that, okay, here is what we think the 12 best teams in the country are, and they all get buys. So yeah. with that being said, I am cool with this, okay. and I like this. But my big problem is Northwestern at 11. I have a big problem with that. Okay. Because I don't think, especially when comparing them to like a Baker or like a Friends. Yeah. I feel like I give the nod to one of those two over Northwestern. Northwestern, with the exception of the Dort game where they shut me up, have not impress me beyond like beyond the Dort game yeah and even then that was such an ugly football game that was three to zero that it's like what do you even do with that right so i i feel bad because i kind of have been crapping on this team because they are a lot different without Jalen Graham. I was going to say, you changed the guy under center and the dynamic of that, <sighs> of that team, it certainly switches. And, and they've taken care of business against some, you know, some quality teams. You look at the beginning of the season, a quality win over a Midland squad there that I know we've talked about a little bit, but against the top competition in their conference, I mean, they weren't able to get it done against Morningside, albeit by a six point margin, yeah. another loss coming against mm-hmm. the Concordia team that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and, and yeah, there, there's been some points throughout the course of the season, maybe they've been a little bit underwhelming, but I do think, you know, they've found a way to win a lot of the games that they're quote unquote supposed to. Now what differentiates a good from a great team, obviously is they go out and win games that they're not supposed to. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's a perfect way to put it. And they haven't, they haven't done that this year. And I don't think it was far enough for me. I know they were like our fringe top 25 team for me a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it's quite that bad now, but, uh, they like they should be in the playoff. I just feel like that by is we're letting that close morning side game do a lot of leg work. And I yep. don't know how I feel about that and the precedent that sets. But 
at the end of the day, I think they still are probably a top 20 ish team mm-hmm. right now. So them being in the playoff isn't even bad. It's just not what I would have done. Um, and what I think the committee should have done. So it's just the situation it is. And also keep in mind after the first round, whatever four teams are left, the pool of 16 is kind of reshuffled. So uh, we might, we might, there might even be some changes with that. I would say they're reseeded, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And I think that that top five for me from Kaiser all the way down to St. Thomas, I think makes a lot of sense from my perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that matches up with a lot of the polls and things too. Not that that is part of their criteria whatsoever, but uh, I think it just goes to show, I think that's a general consensus of where those teams are are pegged in a lot of those different people's minds. Then when it goes from maybe like that eight to 12, you could obviously have some, some moving around. You have a couple Mm -hmm. teams that maybe didn't perform as well out of conference. So you have some of those conference championships in there. Um, I'm sure Texas, Texas Wesleyan maybe would, would like a word coming in at, at 10 and 0 winning their conference outright and, and still being in at the eight spot. But like you said, all these teams will get reseeded depending on some of those performances. So it will be, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah. I don't think you'll see too much shaken up from, from like the top of that list by yeah. ends, but maybe, you know, nine through 12 have to do some worrying. I think Texas Wesleyan's the hard cutoff. I don't think, uh, Texas Wesleyan is going to have to worry about much changing for them. Uh, mm-hmm. I think being 10 and 0 helps a lot. They're a pretty good metrics team. They are a very good football team overall. Um, I think for the most part, they got this right. I said my gripe about Northwestern, but for the most part, like made American Nazarene, absolutely. They've had a fantastic year. Georgetown closed the season on a great note. Mm-hmm. Benedictine has kind of pulled it back together after a couple interesting losses. Um, yeah. Montana Tech, obviously, absolutely just pantsed Carroll. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're, you know, they, they, they're they sitting pretty there in Morningside after the doubts they've had at the quarterback position have really just steamrolled through the rest of the conference like we've come to expect from them. Um, and yeah, you know, St. Thomas, Montana, Western, Indiana, Wesleyan, Grandview, and Kaiser, I think you're... I think that's a pretty good pool to pick from if you're if you're looking at national championship contenders. But really, a lot of teams in this top twelve have a case. So yeah, um, I agree. You know, I think that's I think that's a perfectly fine and okay top twelve. Now the problem is that now we've talked about everybody that's in. Now who didn't make the cut? And there are a lot of teams who have uh, been left out. Yeah, I'm the top of your list right there. I mean, the defenders, yeah. and and rightfully so. You're talking about a game now against Northwestern just, you know, very recently that seems to, from an outside perspective, would have probably made all the difference, right? You look at um, kind of how they weighed the rest of Northwestern's games and put them into that top 12, and now you're looking at Dort, who's on the outside looking in, not even in that kind of that play-in, and that's... That's really tough for them, and it, it felt like you talked about it earlier that the window maybe for this Dort team was right now, mm-hmm. and for them to to just narrowly miss that hurts. It hurts a lot, especially when you know Dort had the chance to do something that they hadn't done before, and yeah. that was beat Northwestern, which would have jumped them into the playoff like outright. And um, it's a really sad way to end the season, but uh, I think they'll be back. I think there's there's something to be said for kind of having that fire. But also the question is, is like they've kind of had this happen a few times. Um, obviously, they, they got in the previous year even. So this is this might even be underachieving for them. In that yeah, program. right. I don't know. Um, so they they had a really good resume. And on paper, SP Plus had them at nine mm-hmm. in the country. They were fantastic this year. But losing to Morningside and Northwestern, you had to pull one of those out. You obviously have a, a good win over Concordia, who we've alluded to before that we will mention in a little bit. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, just got to get it done when it matters most. That's that's the sucky part of it. And it's interesting there, too. I mean, you talked about Northwestern and, and their close games against teams like uh, Morningside and their loss and the other, you know, I mean, that kind of deal. And Dort's right there. I mean, you lost Northwestern, obviously, three to nothing, and then it was a 10-point game against Morningside, a top 10 team at the time. And uh, it, it'd be, it's very interesting to see how maybe that criteria applies in one circumstance and not necessarily in the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the other games, like there is not on the schedule here, there's not a win that is 10 points or less in the, in the margin of victory for this Dort squad. They have either absolutely taken care of business or, or it's been a loss. And so that is, ah, 
that's just got to leave a, a really bad feeling in your stomach if you're if you're over there. But uh, I mean, let's keep it going. Campbell's really talked about earlier a little bit in the mid south. Um, I know it the, feels it feels sad to let go down this list. Yeah. <laughs> It does, man. It I does mean, suck because these teams have had fantastic seasons. Mm-hmm. A lot of the teams we're about to mention have had outstanding seasons for where they've been in the past. Yeah. So it's, but yeah, Campbellsville is definitely one that had is they've had a very successful season. I'm saying they overachieved in, in a lot of different ways of the word, absolutely. and it was just like you do that, and then your expectations come to meet that standard, and now to be left short at the end is, is certainly heartbreaking for them, and you had highlighted here that loss to Lindsey Wilson, which really hurts um, Georgetown, too. Uh, and, and again, both those one-score contests, and to keep it kind of moving here, we go down the list. Evangel, right there in the KCAC, you knew someone out of that uh, that kind of realm right there. Them and McPherson, we could talk about it a little bit too, but um, yeah. you knew there were going to be a couple really quality teams out of the Cashinger there that were going to be left outside. Yeah, for sure. Um, Evangel, like you said, is another one. Just unfortunately getting left out. They were 22nd in SP Plus, had a very fantastic start to the year, just kind of sputtered at the end, unfortunately. Uh, Southeastern is one that I actually really am interested to talk about. Because Southeastern, by all means, like lost to the number one and the number five teams in the country by a touchdown or less. And those were the only games. Ten they points lost. combined. That's and we're we're starting to get a little bit to that SEC argument of like, well, yes. quality losses versus quality, you know, like that whole thing. But Southwest, or sorry, I should say Southeastern. Excuse yep. me. I've been talking about Southwestern a lot. Um <laughs> At 23 in SP plus, like this is a legit top 25 team that is in that conversation. And just because they weren't able to get a more impressive win on their resume during the season because of the way their conference shook out, just sucks. I I really wish I could see them in the playoff because they are a fantastic team. They've had a great year. Them and Dort really are in the same, I mean, very yeah. apples to apples, seemingly, kind mm-hmm. of comparison right there. And I think um, when, when you look at the quality and the caliber of teams that those two losses come to for each of those squads, I would actually argue that Southeastern has a better, you know, has a better <laughs> yeah. argument. But then, you know, I think Dort might have a statement win or two that kind of, you know, piles up. And statistically, I'm sure they lead in a couple other metric as well. But I would lump them into the kind of that same category of, yeah, they got two losses, but the SEC effect thing is a great kind of poll right there out of you. And uh, <laughs> would, a, would the committee take a one-loss Boise State team or a three-loss Georgia team? We all know the yeah. answer to that question <laughs> if they had, you right? So. Yeah. You know, it obviously doesn't shake out the same way here. The name recognition doesn't quite go as far, but it's very much should be along those same lines of thinking. And to keep going down that list, Concordia, Nebraska, in the GPAC, they have the statement win over Northwestern, but they still have the two losses, Morningside and Dort, in conference play. They do, and this is why I'm also even more frustrated with the Northwestern buy because in an ideal world, Concordia probably should have gotten in over them and – Maybe wouldn't have gotten the buy, but like, man, you know, that head to head just doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And that, that's a real bummer. That's a real bummer that that's how it shook out because that, like you said, it's a staple win. You beat, you know, the runners up. That just sucks because that was such a fun win for them. And I was so pumped for that team. <laughs> um, yep. And going down the list, we mentioned Marion earlier too in the episode. They just miss out at 30th in SP plus yep. and eight and two on the season. Have that win over USF uh, Illinois, but obviously losing to USF Indiana is going to kind of just naturally keep you that step down. Taylor's right in the same boat, right? They're two peas Mm -hmm. in a pod right there. Uh, Yeah. The wrong pod, but still in the same pod. Yeah, Taylor is also interesting because they kind of snuck out of nowhere and they put together a nine and two season when I don't think many people had them up that high in their rankings Mm -hmm. preseason. So obviously getting the win over an eventual playoff team, also humongous to your resume, like they had a sneaky chance to to get in with just two losses. So I, it, it kind of sucks to be in their boat, but man, they were they were a good team this year, and I bet next year they uh they'll have something cooking there. Hell yeah, you heard it here first. 
Well, I'll close it out quickly because we've had a lot of talk on on these squads. You had a good list here of those higher rated SP plus teams that missed the cut as well. And at number twelve, Southern Oregon with that that loss to, to College of Idaho was really the nail in the coffin there uh, for yep. the Red Raiders. That squad, which really is disappointing after the year they've had. Number twenty, Bethel, Tennessee in the Mid South, who underperformed just a little bit inside of conference play and then uh, staying inside of that same conference, Lindsey Wilson, who did just drop off um, again, a couple of just uncharacteristic losses from that squad down there. Mm-hmm. And then back in the KCAC with McPherson and uh, this was an undefeated team just a few weeks ago. And, and yep. boy, has it been a landslide the last couple. And it's not like they've been drastic losses, but they have been losses and that it was just enough to really knock them out. And then finally, back in the mid south, we talked about the depth of that conference earlier on. Man, Cumberland uh, down there in Tennessee, seven and three, not enough to make the cut. Mm-hmm. For uh, are they the, the Phoenix? What are they down there? Some kind of bird? Yep. Phoenix. Mm-hmm. We know ball. We know ball. Yeah, know ball. it's uh, it's a bummer for these teams. But a lot of the programs we just talked about, like they are on the up and up. Like yep. Cumberland, Tennessee, McPherson are all in good spots. Southern Oregon's in a fantastic spot. I think it's a bummer to be able to sit in this position and say that you didn't make it, but also you get to sit in this position for the first time in a while for some of these programs. So it's a, it's a sucky silver lining, but it's a silver lining nonetheless. And I think there's a lot for these programs to look forward to going forward. Um, But man, playoffs are here. There's going to be some fun football going on. I'm excited to see how this all shakes out and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun results to talk about next time. Good. Yeah, I think you're right, though, on the overarching message is that this is the start of that proverbial window for a lot of these teams and not the end. Yep. So we should see a Absolutely. lot of these teams in contention for the next couple of years. And if things shake out the way they're supposed to, which never happens, but, um, <laughs> you know, we shall see. But thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate you, dude. Thank you for the insight. You've been great. You betcha. Thanks, man. Have a good night. You too. Thanks, man.